Cole top down. I love this rivalry. <laughs> but it's a fun, it's a key Okay, here we go. We are starting. Uh oh, stinky. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the BTR stream. I am your host, Lev Poliak, of coming at you all the way live, all the way live, all the way live. Don't forget, this week I am on the radio talking uh, for uh, the Rundown Live. I am on their show from uh, 12 noon Eastern to 3 p.m. Eastern, and that is happening tomorrow. I'm going to be joined by Afina Hyatt, the lovely Afina Hyatt. She is coming in tomorrow, and I'm going to have another one on Thursday, as well as an event with Alexander Bard Arash Kolahi, uh, who is a uh, left uh, economist. And uh, we are also going to have Afina Hyatt coming back on that one as well. And that is Thursday at 5 o'clock. So a lot of great events coming for you guys because we love you so, so much. We love you long time. And we really appreciate you being here. All the new people who are here, all the people who are here from Paul Talk, don't forget to subscribe right now because we got to grow and we are going to grow thanks to your help because Patreon. we love each and every one of Patreon. Woo! Patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron today. I swear, if you don't become a patron right now, I'm going to go over to your house. I'm going to give you a spanking. It's going to be a, a nice meaty double slap. Like the Real meaty double there slap. Real meaty can, double slap. You pay extra if Jules comes as well. Woo! <laughs> That's right. Everybody, well, let's Further, okay, uh, further uh, comments aside, let us talk about the main event right now. We have Giovanni Panacchietti, we have Paul Talk, they've got a bone to pick, they've got a score to settle, and we also I've been have playing the Triple H here. theme all day. That's right. <laughs> time to play yeah, the game. Time to play the game. Some, we also have some new people coming in as well. I can we do got the water Nolan, if you want. <laughs> we got Noan, and we got Luke Valentine coming in here. So, there we go. Guys, get ready for it. Let's start with Paul. You are the uh, guest of honor and the competitor of honor here. Can you tell us why you made those videos about Geo? And uh, well, no, let's, what let's... is like, we have to introduce Paul like properly. Sure. Here. Yeah. 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 Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. So Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself first. Well, I'm uh, I'm an American. I've been living in France for 30 years. I'm um, the son of an artist, George Rhodes, and I'm the student of the first, and I consider most important disciple of Marcel Duchamp, and a man named Aaron Curzon, who got to know Duchamp in the 30s. And, uh, okay, that's me. Well, I mean, Excellent. there's a lot more to say. I could tell about my cats. <laughs> I love cats. And by the way, I don't know, I don't but know Paul what Rhodes it's like. But Paul Rhodes is for... a traditional and a YouTuber, and, uh, I don't know what it's like for the audience, by yeah. the way, but I'm hearing a little bit of static in the audio. I'm not sure. Are you guys also hearing that or not? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. So me, I know, Paul, it could, it could be the internet connection, so maybe you can turn the camera off. I don't know if that's going to help or not, but I just want to make sure. All right, sure I'll try. Does All right, that help? Go. I think so. Yeah, I think the audio sounds pretty good now. Do you, okay. do you guys agree? Oh, yeah. Okay, excellent. But no, Paul right. is pretty... Was, in a pretty interesting time period or rather his family, his, his father was an artist that um, really uh, was in the middle of that New York scene. And well, even right before, and if I recall, your uncle was one of the first students of Leo Strauss. Yeah. My uncle was Strauss's first doctoral candidate at mm. Chicago. Oh, he, he, uh, wow. Holy crap. Yeah. That's, he, wow. Yeah. So, and you, you've lived a pretty interesting life yourself. You were in these various uh, art schools. Uh, you went to Pennsylvania, the, the famous one there? No, no. I, well, interesting life. I mean, a very private, uneventful life. But I, in the 70s, I went to four different art schools and dropped out. And I, I knew a lot of artists of my father's generation. And, and I... It, in the early 60s, I saw the emergence of contemporary art because I was going to school on, on the east side at the Steiner School, which is 79th in Madison. And that's where all the galleries were then. I mean, even 59th Street. Is, is that Street. a Rudolf Steiner? Is that based on him? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's a Steiner School in New York. And I went there as a little kid. And I would wander around in, in, in those days, you know, as a seven year old, it was okay. You could wander around New York and nobody cared if you got mugged or not, but you did. <laughs> <laughs> and so 
yeah. And anyway, I, um, I grew up in a time when not just traditional painting, but any kind of representation had become sort of illegal. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to paint representationally and it was very difficult. And I had all kinds of adventures with that. So, okay, that's me. And so why did I react to, to Geo? Well, I react to a lot of videos. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's, 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 say, that's say the least. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's my YouTube thing. I'm, I get stuff off my chest and I, I don't know. I don't know. It's probably no one or somebody probably put me onto Geo. Yeah. I think Rick, uh, Rick dropped that link in your discord. And then I was also a fan of the podcast. So. Yeah. So you guys did it for sure. And so by the way, I... we also have a joining with us. Sorry to interrupt, but I just want to announce we also have joining with us the great Martina Mercota. Welcome to back show. to Break the Rules. It's been a long time. It's a pleasure to have you back with us here, Martina. Thank you for inviting me, especially on this sort of topic. And uh, Paul is a very, very special guy. He just talked about being in the Steiner School, uh, that his uh, father was a uh, uh, with someone who got a doctoral uh, degree. No, my, my uh, uncle. Oh, my oh uncle. your uncle, sorry. Yes, yeah, so your uncle mm. got a doctoral degree uh, with uh, Leo Strauss. And I see these two things actually converging together. If we're talking about the philosophy of Leo Strauss, he is a uh, Platonist. And then we have somebody like Rudolf Steiner who spent a lot of his time getting into these higher vibrations, so to speak. Like he was acquainted with the spiritual realm pretty well. So uh, it's interesting to uh, see, like, do, do these two things in your life, Paul, do they also coincide in the same way? Or is it a slightly different kind of influence? Well, I converted to Catholicism about uh, 25 years ago. And uh, I, I went to several progressive schools. Steiner was considered a progressive school, you know, sort of an outside the box a little bit school. And, and most of those progressive schools have just become prep schools now. But back then they had different kinds of philosophies. It was a little bit wild and woolly. But Can you uh, elaborate yeah, what you sure. Wild I mean, and woolly. Well, I went to a school where the emphasis was on a farm and uh, the so it wasn't, I mean, there was academics, but there was a great emphasis on being outdoors and learning about farm animals and things like that. Yeah, that and sounds like heaven. then I went, Pretty cool. I, I went to um, Dalton for a few years, the end of my high school. And at that time, Dalton had already become a prep school, but there were still some leftovers. And I benefited from that. that that's where I, I met my art teacher. And so I, you know, I was, uh, I was uh, a, a, failure in school, but because I was a talented artist type and uh, I, I, you know, they gave me a diploma anyway, I guess they didn't want to have any failures either, but they would, that, they were okay with that because there were still these leftover progressive things where the kids were supposed to make their own programs and uh, sort of educate themselves in a certain way. Like so unschooling that, in a way. Well, that became like a trend <laughs> later on. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I it was very individualistic. I'm trying to find out here, uh, what uh, what year were you in the Dalton School? I graduated in 74, so I went there for three years. You know what's funny? Because 1974 was the year that Jeffrey Epstein came to uh, the Dalton School to teach math <laughs> and physics. And uh, oh, no he way. wasn't really yeah. that well equipped, oh, no. but it was the guy who ran the Dalton School who was actually... Uh, uh, what was it? Um, William Barr's father, yeah. who oh, was wow. the guy who let Epstein in. Have you ever met William yeah. Barr's father? Well, Barr was the headmaster. Was it the same Barr who the, became the? Uh, I mean, he looked a lot like Barr. It's, yeah, well, it's his father, so uh, it is the same Barr. That was his father. Well, yeah, that was his father. Yeah, I mean, he, he looked a lot like Barr. I, I wondered. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. And did you notice there People. being any kind of, let's say, spook activity when it came to the uh, elder bar in that school? Were there any? Uh, were there any signs? 
Well, I, I know that Aaron didn't like Barr. I know that. Who was who Aaron? And, sorry. And my, my art teacher, Aaron Curson, mm. who, had, who had been there forever. He'd been there back when the school was, you know, super progressive. Interesting. And, uh, you know, Dalton was very special artistically. They had people like Rufo, Rufino Tomayo taught there, if you know who that is. Now they had famous artists teaching there. And Aaron was the, uh, the last hurrah of that. Yeah. Lev is also the, oh. by the way, Lev is also the chair of that. <laughs> you always oh, yeah. see it by this I point. Forgot, yeah. yeah, I forgot about it. And by the way, I really want to figure out a way for Paul to make his avatar bigger. I know that you can go into, and maybe it's not a fight not worth having, but if you go into the lower <laughs> left corner in the video settings, yeah. then you can actually yeah. pick like your avatar again, because Zoom does the stupid thing where it like shrinks the avatar down to a small yeah. size. That's a really Mine's beautiful pretty painting. Normal. Is this a painting that you did, by the way, or no? Yeah, it's a self-portrait. Meeting wow, settings? Is... Yeah, so go into video settings, and you should be able to, inside of video settings, uh, choose a, a different photo. If you go into... Show uh... my video in gallery view? Oh, no, if no? you go into profile. Go into profile, and then you will okay. see your photo. Everybody subscribe right now. If you go and you see your photo <laughs> over here, hover, click it, and there will be a pencil icon. If you click that pencil icon, it's going to let you choose another Love photo. It which is the same photo that you used before. I know this is kind of like inside baseball, but you know we're breaking the rules because we want Paul Talk's beautiful all... <laughs> painting to be shown to the entire I world. I, it's funny I how both of us, our avatars, are both things that we painted. Is this so, only uh, if you have like a Zoom account or something? Like, I can't do this. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you have a Zoom account, account to do that. Work, so, yeah. Paul, yeah. Let, let us Paul know Paul may progress. be on mobile as well. Oh, that yeah, may I, be a little I, bit... I can't figure it out. Okay, fine. Yeah, don't worry that doesn't matter. Please, so, yes. No, <laughs> don't worry. I tried don't my worry best. About it. Subscribe, <laughs> subscribe to Paul Talk on YouTube as well. By the way, I'm gonna post your YouTube oh, no. channel. Post link in the chat. Subscribe to Paul don't, Talk. Don't subscribe to my channel. That's that's my thing. Nobody should subscribe. I don't want it to get any bigger. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, obvious reverse amazing. psychology. Yeah. Obvious reverse psychology. I admire that. That's why we me. said. We said true with a V because it's like black metal, true. <laughs> so if you can uh, find this channel, I believe Paul, I think you might be shadow banned at this point. Do we oh, figure I'm sure that I out? am. I'm sure yeah. I am because you know. why, why, why would you be shadow banned? What's going on? Oh, because I, I do a lot of interaction with uh, white nationalists and, and uh, fascists and so on. But, but, well, but you yourself, well, you, should... you wouldn't describe yourself as a fascist or a white nationalist. Like I, no, I, I'm, yeah, sorry. I know I saw the video you did, um, and it, it's funny because it, I think that's one thing I well among the many things I admire about you is uh, your fearlessness because you did that video on Keith Woods and you got totally just uh, by by his fanboys and it was just <laughs> oh man I, I'd love to have Keith on the show by the way but no I, I feel like um, yeah it's really weird when you engage in uh, different circles. <laughs> um, well, we all know about that would break the rules with uh, the witches and the furries. And, uh, but... Yeah, Martina, you should have been there for all of those streams. You would have been you would have been the superstar. You no, know, I heard about it. You had some drama, I think, with the uh, witchy streams, right? You still, you still mentioning this to you every time. Like, <laughs> Jail was, I found it surreal how we had the e-girl stream. We had like literal porn. By the way, maybe Martina should have went on the e-girl stream. But we Wait, had literal no, porn e stars. <laughs> Because Martina is like the enemy of all e-girls for some reason. But anyways, we're getting off topic. So uh, what I wanted to discuss, I guess the main topic, Lev, what would be the main? Well, the main topic would be the disagreement that you or that Paul Talk has with you when it comes to your view on uh, art. That would be the main topic. I don't know if it's much of a disagree. Well, yeah, I got Yeah. Well, I What's the main thing? Off. What's the main like point? Is it? What's the main point you two have? Like, is it that what's true art and you think it's, like, really well, different to Paul? Well, I guess to... a, good, a good topic, because having, you know, watched a lot of Paul's videos, I guess maybe a general um, introduction to what Paul means by true painting and, and the ethos behind true painting. What, so maybe if you could just really quickly summarize, not quickly, I don't want to limit you, but if you could summarize like what you mean by true painting and what is this idea behind your artwork and the work that 
Uh, because like I said, you came in a very interesting time when the art world was changing and you were right on the cusp of the death of the avant-garde and the rise of contemporary art. So it's yeah. like, yeah. Well, very quickly, uh, I came across the term true painting, not true art, but true painting, which was a term used by what I call the early modernists or the first wave modernists to distinguish them from the second and third wave modernists. And the early modernists were people like Daumier, Puvis de Chavagne, and Manet, and a, a whole cast of other characters, quite diverse. Their concern was to restore the greatness of painting, which was in real trouble in France in the mid 19th century. And they came up with a formulation of what true painting was, which was an theoretical innovation. It was, it was a new way of, of, of understanding what painting was that had become necessary because of this degrading of painting that was, I theorize, a result of the French Revolution. And then, so the, the, the beginning of modernism is actually a reactionary movement. They're, they're going back to Poussin, they're going back to you know, the, the old masters. And, that, and, and the way they formulated painting eventually gave rise to what we now call more and more abstraction. And, mm -hmm. and gave, so the second wave modernism began to happen because the, the artists were very concentrated on the decorative, what was then called the decorative aspect of painting. In other words, what we call the plastic aspect of painting, as opposed to the illustrative aspect of painting. Painting had become very, very illustrative and painters were forgetting about these fundamentals. For the early modernists, True painting was the correct relationship between the illustrative aspect and the decorative aspect. And ultimately, the illustrative aspect is what happens spatially when you put marks so that uh, movements like cubism and phobism, what I call second wave modernism, are trying to deal with that as much as possible. and and. And, and putting away the superficial aspects of representation. Mm -hmm. Like, in other words, they're bodying the decorative aspect of what then later Greenberg would call catch, in other words. And, <laughs> <laughs> I, because I think we're in agreement with that. I feel that, Yeah. and hopefully my work is some, somewhat like that, although I tend to illustrate, uh, I'm not, well, I, I wouldn't consider painting, myself painting, illustration, but. Pa painting should illustrate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a problem with painting when, when it doesn't. But if we have a disagreement, it's that you are, I mean, I, I regard it as, as brave and generous on your part. You, you're trying to see good in certain things in contemporary art, which mm -hmm. I just condemn. And <laughs> evil, 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 evil all the time. Well, what are evil. what are some examples of the contemporary art that Gio does not condemn that you think are deserving of the uh, condemnation? Well, let's, he did a video. Let, let's see well, right you, you there. told you. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, we I didn't I don't know what Gio says about bacon, but I I watched uh, a video where he talked about um, Kiefer, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. And then I thought he was um, a little soft on, what is it, Dunham? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, by the way, we have, we have a guest here, and I want to get their impression as well of some of Dunham's stuff. I know, Gio, if you could post some in the uh, BTR chat, just I like the I stuff that's not some. not as X-rated. I mean, I know it's oh, like no, a Oh, no, then I, that's impossible. That's, it's well, impossible. Well, okay. It's, it's, so, it's kind of, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, <laughs> see what you can do, please. But basically, uh, Cream of Dog. We have Cream of Dog here for the very first time. What's up, dog? What is up, boys? We're not talking about Lena Dunham. Well, we're oh, talking well, about Oh, it's Lena dad. Dunham's father. Not yet. Oh, her dad's a painter? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, no, he what? isn't. He's not no, a he isn't. <laughs> <laughs> What's his first name? Look up some of his stuff. 
Yes. He, and by the way, something's, something's weird beans. with your something's weird with your audio. By the way, cream of dog. Like it sounds a bit muffled. I'm not sure if there's you got a robot to do about voice that. going on. Oh there's, no. Gee, I'm oh. trying. I'm trying to find Gio, one. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Put it. Put put green ch triangles on the naughty bits. Wait, would would uh? Oh, I'll do, Yolo's... Yeah, I will. I will. I'll no, do, here I could do that. I'm good at that stuff. Circle. So would Yolo's stuff or Cream of Dogs stuff uh be some contemporary art that he that Paul does not like? Let's see. Paul loves me. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, where's your face, bro? So oh, you have problems Cream, with Cream of Dog has a comic series called uh, Sissy Hypno Hour. Which is very appropriate, <laughs> by the way. Oh, I don't know if uh, Cream of Dog, if you were following our Frank Hassel saga, where we had Frank Hassel on. We had him on two times, actually. And uh, he has uh, this uh, video he did where he dresses up as the good doctor, Dr. Don Wario. And he goes around the store and uh, tries to bimbify and sissify uh, this uh, old Latin American looking guy. And he calls him Jessica. I've seen that one. Yeah, he's he's a uh, he's a nut, man. He is, yeah. <laughs> let me let of, me put in my uh, let me put in my because I, I forget. I think it was one car Y that mentioned it in the chat or someone else about my uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg painting in the style of Francis Bacon. So <laughs> I, love I love that. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> I love that one, man. Is that just like bird shit on a wall? I don't know. I, don't I, know I it's like, well, I, I spent, I basically did that. Like, it took me a year to wait for her to die to post it. <laughs> it's just kind of like fucked. But, um, yeah, I have, I have one I'm doing of Joe Biden rec recently. So, uh, but I'll keep it under wraps, uh, till till the uh, inauguration. But, um, it's the same style, the the bacon style. Well, yeah, it's it's it'll be like that one uh, uh -huh. dark painting by oh, yeah. um, Goya, where the the three uh, the th what is it the three fates, the three old men were like it was the, it was really one of the first times uh, that people were using paint in such a way that not one of the first, but the way that uh, he never I think because he never intended for people to see them. Uh, they were like some of my favorite works by Goya besides his etchings. But, but Paul, would you say that Goya would be the first modernist painter? That's what they say. He was like the jump off. Or, uh... Well, you know, now, now um, modernism, it, in the sense of modernism, in fact, was a reactionary movement. But with the ideolo ideology of progress, everything has to be more and more modern. So now when they want to praise something in the past, oh, it's so modern. You know, Rembrandt, it's so modern. Oh, Giotto, it's so modern, incredibly <laughs> modern. Oh, the Greeks, they're so modern. Oh, the cave paintings, they're modern. My God. You know, it just, Man, just <laughs> words. this foolishness that goes on. Well, actually, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like describing art with words, I, mean, I don't know. I don't mind doing that. I mean, this, I like describing, talking about the generalness of art, but I feel like art, when I see a painting, you know, the, this, is, this isn't very good, but this is like something I did very quickly. I don't want to describe this. Look, you look at it. There you go. It's done. The Eye of Horus. <laughs> hold it yeah. still. No, I don't like it. I don't like it. That's why I didn't want to hold it still. That's why I didn't want to... I think, in fact, you know how a piece of art isn't good when I didn't realize it was the wrong way around? There you go. There you go. This <laughs> is that piece the eyes are on top. Now. And by the way, here is finally Carol yeah. Gunham. I managed to censor you this. For the <laughs> you had to censor <laughs> half of the fucking painting. Yeah, he's the, the one that, that Paul yeah. Joseph Watson pointed out. And I, in fact, that was the exact painting, I believe, that I included in my review of that gallery, uh, the 70 pager. But no, I think, I don't know, I, I feel like uh, it's funny that me and Paul were in the same headspace in, in terms of modernism, because within artistic modernism, there was always a pull towards the anti-modern. There was a way of sort of dropping out whether it was, you know, Edvard Monk, the German expressionist, Gauguin. Well, I mean, Gauguin, you could say, unfortunately, lended itself to, I don't know, not that I want to, like, start Saeed posting and saying that Orientalism is a thing, mm. but it, it seems that within modernism, there is sort of like a, a wave of reaction there that I, I find has, in certain instances in contemporary art, is sort of uh, been given space. But, I mean... It's it's a hard it's a hard 
thing to say because a lot of like in fact most contemporary is total woke trash but it's just <laughs> it's just um it's very i i feel that with the implosion of art movements themselves it's like every artist has the obligation uh to create their own uh micro brand and their own micro mythology and it's uh i don't know i feel like i i have hope in one sense that there is spaces being created for artists to do genuine reaction but i don't know <laughs> i don't know i mean mm. i get where paul is coming from obviously but uh i, I don't know why well so uh, we have a question from putuna is animation considered an art i think well definitely but uh cream of dog you make animations uh yourself and would you consider what you do as a uh, art or how, how would you describe it i think uh animation definitely is art i don't think maybe my animations are art but i think i don't think anyone would uh argue that you know what i mean i hope my voice isn't too robo right now but i think mm -hmm. uh everyone can, would say, can you try calling via phone by the way because that may let me uh, try that let me try that brb yeah, and Martina, I think what you do is definitely art. And uh, you talk about art as well. You talk about the Renaissance art. And uh, those are some great streams that you do. And by the way, guys, make sure to subscribe to Martina's YouTube channel. I'm going to post it here in the chat as well. But uh, I wonder if you, Paul, and Gio have the same mind about like uh, rena Renaissance art. I mean, look, who doesn't like Renaissance art? I don't know. Is there anything that I'm missing here? Does everybody agree that Renaissance art is... Uh, you know, one of the greatest things that have ever occurred in human history as far as the art goes? Or am I being a simp? Or am I being a normie here? I don't know. Well, I don't know. Show me some Renaissance... I like, I'm not that experienced with Renaissance art, but is that the kind of stuff, the the, the church paintings? What is it? The, that, or the hand of God? Is that Renaissance? Or is that not? Well, sure, yeah. But not just the church painting. I mean... No, I know. No, also... I'm saying, but that's yeah. an example of it. Yeah, so like the Sistine Chapel yeah. is part of it. Yeah, Chapel. I mean, okay, there's like... Good. Okay. Yeah, like I think Baroque goes into like all Renaissance and stuff. There's like little subcategories, mannerism, like all sorts of stuff that kind of go into Renaissance. Yeah, I'm, I believe, I'm more of a right? fan of the Baroque and mannerism, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I like well, Paul, the golden Paul, what age. You... you know yeah. the golden age of illustration. I like that. Uh, I think um, if you look at some of the what was it, the Sistine Chapel. If if you look at how how um, was that Michelangelo painted some of the women they're they're painted after bodybuilders and he kind of had <laughs> yeah. a, you know sculpt their breasts in a way that looked like somebody stuck tennis balls in a body whoa whoa whoa, whoa. Uh, you're talking about breasts how degenerate yeah. okay I know I'm sorry I'm sorry no, uh, I, no I'm I, just I, making a joke <laughs> because I tend to make this joke a lot tend to make the joke a lot on my streams because I get attacked. And this is the dynamic too when we talk about these right-wingers and when we talk about incorporating- What did you, you know, see my, my, my video Martina? Did you see my video oh, about- No, is it a recent one or is it one that you linked to me before? Uh, I think a week or two ago about- Okay, no, I didn't see because I, I haven't been on social nude. media much. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I want to check it out. To you. Yeah, please do. I mean, I wrote a piece in 2016 about like art in the nude or whatever, but I tend to, speaking about these- right wingers, you know, nationalist, uh, nationalist, white nationalist, whatever, um, is that I tend to get attacked a lot because my artwork does deal with nudity. Um, I was inspired by, um, you know, Greek and Roman sculptures, well, Greek sculptures, because they had did a lot of the goddesses and the draped fabrics and like the tit out or something. But a lot of my costuming is also very Renaissance with like halos and like very religious kind of looks. So that was my inspiration. Uh, for my type of artwork, which is, you know, performance arts <laughs> and dancing, but that also lends itself to photography, you know, video works and stuff like that. And I try to do a lot of very painterly type works, which was very different compared to modern contemporary performance art. Uh, and I always felt like I used some of these like old things, but made it kind of new again and fresh. And my inspiration was the old, but these right wingers online tend to attack me as degenerate or or, or okay uh, can i have some examples because I, I i know that i i believe that you're getting like some form of something from someone but what do you mean like attacked by right wingers tell me what you mean well they all generally i mean we can talk about i know um when people mark collette has has said that i was uh, a degenerate because of my artwork um you know venti goes on about it a lot <laughs> uh people try to i oh. think troll me in a way of like He's a degenerate, you know? And so I don't think that, I think there's a, 
a lack of understanding with art or it's just personal attacks on me and they're pretending they don't understand the difference. I, mean, atta- I feel like the, I'm just, it's more me and the word attack. I, I, I if think- you use a different word, it just seems a bit extreme when you say attack, that's all. That's me being a bit autistic. Well, it's well, literally an attack. <laughs> if you haven't seen the video, it's literally an attack. But, yeah. well, no, I, I want to ask, uh, like I ask I uh, Paul talk. Uh, Paul, what do you think about uh, when it comes to the uh, Renaissance, nudity, some people would equate that with degeneracy and all that, like with the Catholics, since you're, um, you've are you converted to Catholicism now, when it comes to the Catholics, yeah. I mean, obviously during the Renaissance, there were depictions of much nudity, but there were also depictions of uh, gods and goddesses and all that fun stuff. But uh, there are some people, though, who would, let's say, take a look at an uh, Italian man who I saw recently when I was uh, uh, walking by my old Catholic school, and I saw this Italian man go next to the um, uh, to the altar of Mary and do like the uh, ritual, you know, like signing of the cross, and uh, it looked very similar. And again, my apologies to all the Catholics, but it looked very similar to pagan rituals, just as far as like this uh, statue in front of you that you are giving energy towards. So do you think that, number one, what do you think of the uh, nudity that was present in the Renaissance as far as, uh, you know, whether you would consider that degenerate or not? I mean, I, I don't. I think that's uh, ridiculous personally. But also, do you see a link between paganism and Catholicism that can never really be fully uh, separated? Well, first of all, um, the, the human body has always been the essential subject of art from ancient primitive sculpture. Uh, you know, in the medieval times, you, all you have to do is look at some capitals in Gothic churches and you know, the, the, the human form is everywhere. It's the essential thing is be, because it's, it's the thing that is, I don't know, it's the, the most interesting thing we have to look at. And, and, I, and I think our interest in everything else is like um, waves reverberating out from what we see when we, we look at the, at the human body. So in a way, I see that as a non-issue. People have different attitudes at different times. And I, uh, I agree. But uh, as far as, let's say, uh, pornography goes, where do you personally draw the line between what is considered art and what is considered pornography? Or is there, is there a line? Well, well, you know, well, sure. It's when it becomes purient. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a fuzzy line, but it's a question of attitude. So, and, and it's, it's something that's easy to recognize when, when, when people, you know, it's evil. That's, <laughs> it's, it's when it gets evil. Oh, that's... Well, how how do you define uh, that kind of evil if we're talking about? Yeah, when you call art forms you know... evil, what do you mean by? Uh, well, yeah, I, that, Francis Bacon I gotta... is evil, and uh, um... well, yeah, I, I got. Well, we know Marina Abramovic is evil, or... but I mean, <laughs> I guess it's about well, what be, the artist because... does. Sorry, my bad. You... After you. Well, first Paul, then Luke. Yeah. Well, um, I got into this with Chris Johns. We did a lot of videos back and forth about this. It, this um. Martina said something about this, but the whole business in contemporary art is each individual is closed in on themselves. They are generating a world. Each person is an ultimate creator and they're right, going to right. discover a new universe. There is absolutely no commonality and, and any kind of commonality is looked upon as some kind of imposition from outside that has no creative impulse. The impulse is it's very Freudian. It's the id bubbling up and creating this new thing. So uh, th- that's what that's what people have to do. And, and we're, 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 we're in the situation where, uh, which is philosophical relativism, if you like, where we, we can't get out of that and, and get people to turn their eyes and turn their minds towards the real. And, and what's what's common to us is is what's real and and painting has certain laws which are eternal if you like certain things always happen when you start putting marks on a flat surface and that's a very natural very human thing to do and 
beyond all different kinds of styles and all different kinds of attitudes and all the different things that painting can be used for, there is a fundamental that's going on. And that fundamental was never forgotten through all of human history and prehistory. And then the French Revolution, we got more and more into ideology and art started be becoming instrumentalized in different ways. And now it's totally instrumentalized in this uh, you know, Nietzschean, Heideggerian festival of ultimate individualism and each individual generating their own cosmos. And it's a lie because we actually live in, we all live together in this world. And we have, of course, each person is, has some individual characteristics sometimes. But, but isn't, but, but you attack Heidegger, but isn't that Heideggerian thrownness? I mean, that's the essence of Heidegger right there. I mean, isn't what he's saying about being about Dasein being an, a level of thrownness into the world, and we're always stuck in the middle of the other and the 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 being of beings, and, and yes, mm -hmm, yeah. except that except that we live not in Heideggerianism. We live in vulgar Heide, Heide, Heideggerianism. Oh, we're thrown into we're thrown into our culture, but it's vulgarized the way Nietzsche is vulgarized. Nietzsche, you know, the Superman there was gonna be these wonderful uh, ph you know, philosophers of the future, but now everybody's a philosopher of the future. <laughs> School of life philosophy. <laughs> and, and, but, but the problem with Heidegger is that he, we're thrown into our culture and we are then cut off from other cultures. So, so that even if you accept that we're, in, we're thrown into our culture together, we're thrown into a different culture from what it was 300 years ago. That has nothing to do with us. It's a whole different thing. And people say this all the time, you know, you, well, especially in the 70s and 80s. They would say, oh, God, well, Beethoven, who knows what he was doing? And, or, you know, so it, it, it's, a, it's a real problem because when you go into a museum and you look at a painting, you're having an experience now. That painting is a reality for you and anybody else who looks at it. And we look at these things and they're so tremendous. You know, Rubens, what, pick, the, pick whatever painter you like. You know, we have this experience with Rubens. It's part of our world. It's, it's, it becomes part of who we are. But, and, but they're just yeah, old dead yeah. white men, Paul. Don't you know that? Well, that's they're old dead cis white men. I want to show you, you, uh, show you a work. For, by irony. I want to show you work by a live white man who is in front of us today, Luke Valentine. So, Luke, Yo. this is one of your beautiful pieces. I don't have to censor ah, anything, you, but uh, over here, it's it's half of it. So I wonder if you could find the other half and uh, send it to me. But uh, this is uh, one of your characters. W what's your name, Luke? Yeah, that's uh, okay. Well, now we're, we're now we're talking about my personal work. That's a little embarrassing. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's part of a comic I made called Splatterbrain, which... I know we're talking about, you know, fancy artists and everything and what's good. This what's is people. fancy art. And uh, yeah, but but my comic's name's Splatterbrain. So it's a little bit, it sounds <laughs> lowbrow, but it's not lowbrow. Um, I'll just put it that way. But anyways. Well, people called subject. Rubens lowbrow back in the day. Mm, so oh, lowbrow, lowbrow is You're good. onto something then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See? Um, but uh, what, what, what I wanted to remark on was like, whether or not like art is like what's what makes good art and what makes like evil art like what you I think that's what you're talking about earlier and uh I think it's about the intention of both the artist and like the art and like how it's necessarily so it's Definitely. like yeah so basically it's like does a piece of art uplift you and like does it make you feel something does it like galvanize you does it make you want to like does it inspire you in some way or does it, is it like an advertisement that's really well put together and makes you want to go and like, you know, you know, respond to impulse and go buy something? Or is it like pornography where it makes you go want to like hide in the bathroom, hide in the corner and, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> give into your passions. I'm you, know what's, you, say. you know what's crazy? I think that I've had this conversation on Twitter. I think you were involved, Luke, where I said that graffiti like uh taggers are some of the last true artists in the world because graffiti art has been colonized by corporations where they'll yeah. pay taggers to fuck go Banksy. out and do fuck Banksy. Fuck yeah. Banksy. yeah they'll, yeah, they'll, fuck they'll pay yeah. muralists to go out and make corporate advertising in graffiti wild style it's like fucking calvin klein and wild style can you believe this <laughs> but yeah this that's 
I don't know. Well, what do you, what do you, what does the rest of the panel think about yeah. what makes good art, what makes bad art? Well, I also wanted to get. A, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Luke, but I really love your work, and I wanted to get. I Paul like that Bob's one opinion work. of it. I because like, it's like a different world, but I'm curious. Like, Paul, you. What, what do you think about that girl in the, uh, in the red, <laughs> the red well, swimsuit? If you notice, she was she was Catholic, Paul. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. Cross. It's all I, flashing by so fast. The, oh, well, the other yeah. one, go to the other oh, one. Oh, here, here, yeah, yeah. I will show you the uh, second one over here. Yeah, because I, I'd want to also bring, like, as if I was like a farmer, I would bring my cattle <laughs> and my GF along with me on my back. So there oh. you go. I will yeah. milk you, them both, you of beautiful course. Beautiful ideas in your head. It's uplifting. <laughs> See, yeah. Well, there you well, go. I you milk the cow by night, by day, milk her by night. So that's uh. <laughs> well, all right, all right. You can put it that way, sure. <laughs> that one kind of reminds what? me of. Paul's, it's like an inverse of Paul's Rape of Europa. Yeah, it kind of does! Oh, oh my I didn't know God. what you're talking about. <laughs> Some sort you, of, uh... Yeah, Lev, if you could find Paul's Rape of Europa, that would be... Okay. Be... One second. But, I don't know, I, I, f I feel we're, we're off to a good... Um... <laughs> Oh, wait, Paul, I, what's I, your surname, by the way? Because I keep calling you Paul Talk. You have an actual surname. You have an actual last name. Rhodes. Yeah. Rhodes, Rhodes. perfect. Rhodes. But you can call me Paul Talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, th but I think like uh, this is good. I I think the disagreement stems from what we mean by um, when we're talking about I, now that Paul has described the difference between Heideggerianism and vulgar Heideggerism. I feel that you know when, when you talked about huh, how should I say this without offending anybody. I'm more sympathetic, uh, although I wouldn't consider myself a white nationalist. I am sympathetic to a lot of what people like Keith Woods talks about, because I do feel that the American project ha has been corrupted beyond repair. But Paul, I noticed through his videos, talks about the same sort of like American conservative uh, stuff it mixed in with Strauss of trans historical truths being embodied on the hill on the rock. But I feel that uh, because of, you know, various forces, late capitalism, the decay of, uh, of various, <laughs> I, I know, yeah, as soon as I said late capitalism, uh, I, I know <laughs> you're going to go off, but I, I feel that various forces of modernity uh, has led a lot of that sort of um, irreconcilable. That's, that's Titian. That's Titian. And that's not Paul. <laughs> oh. Paul's that's rape of Europa is much more violent. Okay, yeah, let me see yeah. if I could find it. But uh, no, I feel that in, in the in, in within our time frame, within our particular episteme, I feel that a lot of that stuff. I, I'm more of the opinion of when it comes to art of John David Ebert that we have to reconcile the fact that every artist is within like the ashes of the wake of the great collapse of mass civilization signifiers. And we have to, and artists have the uh, the job to sort of pick up the pieces, and people do this very well. Or people like Biskinski, who are playing with the sort of the apocalypticism of this great collapse, uh, what Nietzsche predicted, the rise of the last man. And so I feel that uh, Paul, you want to sort of not ignore this, but uh, I don't know. I feel that the art that's being produced now. Uh, whether we're talking about Francis Bacon and uh, Anselm Kiefer and Justin Mortimer and people like that, I feel that it's reflective of the times and we can't necessarily ignore it. Although most art, I, I do sympathize because in the contemporary art world, there is art being made purely because of corporatism, purely to sell an ideological message and art that's being promoted doesn't really reflect mm. our particular time. It reflects the time period of people that have bourgeois white liberal opinions. Uh, you know, like after the neoliberal white... kitsch, right? I'm going to put like neoliberal kitsch exactly. But I would say that's why there's an importance on art, and you know, if the the left are utilizing it in a way, but I feel like that's what's missing on the right. I'm not saying like ruin the concept like perverse the idea of art um and not have it be true but i feel mm -hmm. like the appreciation for art is on the left side and they know how to use it to tap I into the archetypes of right people and left. i think art goes beyond right and left i have I think it has nothing to do with okay i don't know what your deal is but i'm trying to make a point and you keep trying to like word police me 
I'm and not trying to no, wordplay you. We I'm all, trying to say we I think know, it's beyond. We all know it's beyond left and right. I mean, okay, wow, brilliant concept. Yeah, we I'm get it. Oh. I'm not trying to be like that. Oh. I'm not trying to be like that. Finally. I'm not trying to be like that. Fine, shut up. I'm not trying to be like that. I don't know. I don't even know. I'm not trying to be like that. Sorry, so, okay, Martina, finish your point, then we'll go to Mr. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I just... And by the way, this is Paul's Rape of Europa. And and I think you know I really okay. like that because that's really that painting alone is worth probably the thousands of hours of uh, white nationalist podcasts out there. <laughs> so I don't know. It's uh, not to shoot, not to you know shots fired, but <laughs> anyway. Sorry, Martina, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying the importance of art, and that's uh, you know something that I feel like could be utilized more in certain sections if you want to call it that whatever I like this I comment over here it. myself is just autistic please be patient <laughs> yeah please oh I am a but, bit, so but but at the same time i don't know i feel that the the problem is that the people that focus on art and aesthetics on the political right unfortunately they you can't really cargo call what they're doing uh, excuse me, did you say right, Gio? You can't say right. There, It's beyond left and right, okay? <laughs> no, no, I know, but on the cultural oh, right, wait, just... point. <laughs> No, wait, wait, myself. Sorry, you go first and then I'll... No, I get a point. No, I, whatever, the point... You're going on a different conversation. I want to see what Cream point. of Dog has to think fine, about all this. Cream of Dog. I'm on Martina's side. I'm on Martina's side. Yeah, fine. So you can make I, no, but I feel that even, like... What I mean, yeah, go beyond left and right. But what I mean is that in terms of art itself, I feel that, you know, when art is simply a vehicle of propaganda, I it, there's something about it that isn't going to last. It's tainted. I mean, exactly, yeah. I mean, there's certain aspects of social realism that has lasting power, but I feel that when a lot of people look at it and like, okay, how come we can't politicize art the way that the political left is, the way that people like get art grants for writing black lives matter on a canvas yeah, and, I, and i mean sorry i feel that that's the wrong approach like that's yeah not yeah, the no, point you. you know i just feel like there's a way that art can tap into the hearts and minds uh you know the archetypes that's why during the counter-reformation the reformation and the counter-reformation the catholic church you know used art to tap into the hearts minds and souls mm -hmm. that's why we created the sistine chapel and all the wonderful baroque baroque artwork that we have today that was the catalyst for that it was like hey how do we tap into this same thing with uh roman sculptures and stuff like that the uh you know emperors the, the people the rulers at the time they knew they could use art to you know show how grand they are how important they are the the you know solidity of their culture and, and stuff like that so there is value to it and it's a way to do it where it's not perverse it's not like trying to brainwash or use it as propaganda per se but in a way not all propaganda is bad um but it's a way to tap into the hearts and minds and, and make a statement that is more innate and more arch archetypal yeah art that's explicitly political isn't uh like uh, what we're looking at lindy. here yes. put it yes. down yes what, wait what did you let me see. oh yeah oh here. that one that one <laughs> Just, oh boy! I don't know. I feel like when we when we discuss like what's art and stuff, and this is why I was saying the right and left thing. This is why I got annoyed at that. Cause it's not really annoyed at you, but it's the fact that like I feel like discussing what is art isn't like the important question, and especially when it gets to, like right and left politics, which is something that really like annoys me because I like I'm very weird with politics, and I just say, well, I wanted to discuss something more than you know what's art. I don't know, like. Because I feel like shit like this, like, sure, you could consider it art, but it's just shit. Like, I just think it's shit, and I'm just, I don't know. I feel that's that's just an opinion, and then it's, like, gets into, wrapped into all this fucking opinion bullshit, and it just kind of wraps around on itself. I don't think I've ever had a productive conversation talking about what art is, but then when we start talking about the history, you know, like, Paul talks very adverse in history, I find that more productive and more interesting. Like, Well, there was an interesting comment that uh, somebody left me over here. Let me put it up. On the uh, stream that we had with Charles Carroll of uh, Charles Carroll of a Million Dollar Extreme, that was a that was a great interview. I really enjoyed talking with him. And let me see the comment right over here. This was addressed to. By me. the way, you know when Paul yes. Paul you were saying about um, the problem is that artists nowadays lack a community and lack sort of a school, uh, a, a group that like for example, one of my favorites is the the Northwest Visionaries like Mark Toby and uh and morris graves I, I i agree with you but let's let's see someone that disagrees with you paul this absolutely yeah. stunning take by an absolute visionary of our time so here it is in the chat 
There, did you see it, love? Oh, uh, <laughs> what? I posted uh, in the BTR. Oh, let me see over here in the uh, chat. Let me scroll down to the bottom. Here there we go. go. Yeah, there you go. I mean, uh, Paul, we don't really need people to conglomerate together as artists. I mean, that's really, that's just old fogey stuff, Paul. <laughs> well, that's that's not what I'm saying. No, no, I know, no, I'm making, I'm making, I'm making a joke, well, Paul, if you know. All right, well, <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, I'll highlight the quote, some... highlight the tweet, uh, love. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh wait, no, sorry, sorry, that's it. the wrong one. Sorry, not the wrong, oh. not that one, not that one, not that one. Okay, sorry, sorry, <laughs> delete it, delete it. No problem at all. What and is this one? one. With all the sperm people who are this one. Here you go. That's the what real kind of one. weird crap are you linking, Shio? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was some other person in blue check I was eating on. That's yeah, something look. else. Don't just forget about that. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to make art or write or learn, it's tempting to think that you need a community. So looking for other weirdos and assuming you're part of some common family of weirdos and that you're in thing together, but ultimately the act of creation is subverted to enforce conformity. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's that's yeah. that's the attitude. That's the attitude. Well, no, I, I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna miss tweets like that. I I don't have. No, your band is with everybody else. But uh, no, I feel that in some ways Campbot is right. But oh, did I say his name? Sorry. Uh, in some ways Campbot is right. But I feel that I don't know. Th this just is a totally like jaded. Uh, uh, you know, having been a part of fellow artists, like for example, finding Luke Valentine, for instance, and Martina. I feel that artists do need community. And they do need a sense of belonging. And that's unfortunately, but I don't know. I mean, maybe people in the professional art world do feel this, but yet there's so much mediation between the forces of commodification and what gets produced and what gets promoted that, I don't know. I feel that the, the like, for example, the Vienna secession of like outsiders getting together and subverting the establishment. That's kind of like, I don't know, that's, that's the thing of the past nowadays. I Just don't know. real quick, by the way, speaking of Luke Valentine, this is the full photo from the Splatter Brain comic. Oh, and oh, I yeah, love there we go. her thighs, by the thighs. way. That's warming me up right here. <laughs> Bruh. Yeah. You got prints on this? <laughs> now I'm planning on it, though. If it, if it blows up, it needs to blow up. It's getting a little bit of traction. People are throwing yeah. money my way, but you know, it's got to oh, be. Who knows? Uh, Trying to get if, a little if, more if it gets big enough, it. if it gets big enough, then your fans, some of them will actually blow it up literally by creating just like fat Nolly and all like by making a huge oh, uh, God. picture. I mean, of I've your been characters. getting some good fan art. Like I've been people have been sending me fan art of the characters and that like, oh, that that fills my heart. That makes me see, that makes me see the beauty in the world. But the moment I get an inflation thing going on, or something, I'm gonna I don't know what I'm gonna do. Honestly. You know, she's a lifeguard, right? Isn't she a lifeguard? Yeah. yeah. So oh, yeah. inflation would actually be great for her because oh, if she's out there yeah. saving somebody, <laughs> you know, just psh, oh, and that's what a it. nightmare. I don't know what yeah. I'm gonna do. Do I retweet it? I mean, they put they put effort into it. They put hard work into that. Yeah. What do I do? Like, well, she has to have it? she has to have a needle so that when she inflates, she has to ask pop. the guy uh, who she saves just twist the knife to, to puncture her with this the, yeah, the knife for the needle, and then just like a cartoon, like out of Bugs Bunny or something. Just, don't, please don't, he's, don't, don't. He's willing to <laughs> no, don't don't go down this gonna road. <laughs> And Paul then, has and no idea what like we're talking flat. about. Then she's like a pancake. <laughs> then, so then she's like a rubber pancake thing, and you just have to Thank like, God. you know, just like. <laughs> yeah. What? Well, well modern, modern hermeticist, friend of the show, Virgil's Ennead was both propaganda and art. Yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah. I guess I mean, for example, the Peloponnesian War. That's sort of level. That's brought up to the level of. Hmm. Art well, it was during the ways. reign of Augustus, right? Wasn't he simping for Augustus in that book? I think was he shimping for Augusta? Maybe, yeah. Well, if we're talking about that oh, was I'm after the Trevarium, right? No, that sorry, was sorry. The... I'm thinking of uh, sorry. I'm thinking of Ovid. I'm thinking of Ovid's Metamorphosis. That's the one that I believe was simping for uh, uh, Augustus. I don't know, Martina. You're more of an expert on this stuff than I am. Oh, sorry. What, what what's going on, Augustus? Art, do you know, do you know about like Ovid's Metamorphosis? Was he simping for uh, Augustus in that book? Because that was the reign of Augustus. So I think like a lot of these uh, prestigious writers and poets, they had to do their you know they had to do their job, so to speak. They had to uh, they had to make sure that the emperor knew that they were on his side and they were you know complimenting him and doing all, all right. this stuff. So I'm not exactly yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean I th that sort of thing used to happen. Yeah, that sort of thing used to happen all the time. I, f I feel like I went to the Met and I saw something too that was something about that 
that had to do with like a British artist uh, with like a bust. He came from Italy. Damn, I have to look it up. But no, you're probably thinking I know a lot about all this stuff. I mean, I do art history streams, but um, I'm not claiming to be an art history <coughs> expert. Uh, I just here since uh, what is it? What what university? It's not Harvard. Uh, Princeton. Since Princeton decided to get rid of their art history program because it was too focused on white Western culture, I took their textbook and I'm. I'm reading through the textbook online. We'll continue to keep it alive. So I'm not a super Excellent. expert on it, but I find it fascinating. No, that, I learn every great. day and I hope others learn every day. No, that yeah. is a very important thing to do. And uh, God bless you for doing that. And uh, recently you heard about that whole thing about uh, getting rid of, what was it? The Odyssey in one school. Like they didn't burn it, but they might as well. You know, they got rid <laughs> of uh, the Odyssey from the curriculum for the same what was reason. The yeah, what's the logic there? Uh, mm, let's Western see. I think it was too. the same, the same one you were talking about right now. Let me take a look. The Odyssey, uh, band school. I'm going to read this for you, uh, right now. Here we go. So Homer. Okay. So uh, this is from the national Herald Homer mobbed as a Massachusetts school bans the Odyssey. So let's see, let's see what they go on to say over here. Uh, here we go. Okay. The study of Homer's epic poems goes back to antiquity at least, but a recent movement is attempting to throw the baby out with the bathwater and ban classics like Homer's Odyssey in case they might offend someone. An opinion article titled Even Homer Gets Mobbed, published in the Wall Street Journal, highlights the effort to remove classic works of literature from classrooms across the United States because those classics that make up the Western canon were written in the past where offensive attitudes were prevalent throughout the world. As Megan Cox Gurdon writes, a sustained effort is underway to deny children access to literature. Under the slogan, hashtag disrupt texts, critical theory ideologues, school teachers, and Twitter agitators... Uh, are purging and propagandizing against classic texts, everything from Homer to F. Scott Fitzgerald to Dr. Seuss. Even Dr. Seuss, my God. So, good doctor. The Dr. good doctor, Bruce. Dr. Don Wario. <laughs> Here we go. So, so this is what we're up against. And uh, there was a comment that was left for me uh, in the conversation with uh, Charles Carroll. And uh, I was asking about whether or not we're going to maybe go back to this... Um, uh, what do you call it, to this uh, age of there being Medici's and other rich folks who actually care about good art like it was back in the day. Yeah. And this is a comment from Eric Yeah, that McFarland. was also... Yeah. What's going on? Sorry, uh, go ahead. Yeah, the Medici's... Uh, yeah, so th this is the comment <laughs> from Eric... There's a delay. This, this is the comment from Eric McFarland. Lev, on the question where you ask if there will be any more Renaissance-esque time periods, I think that won't happen again because back then the rich were royalty and had little risk of losing their status and wealth, so when they commissioned art pieces, they did it for themselves and future prosperity, posterity. Whereas in today's world, status and wealth are fleeting, so everything must have a return on investment and be sold to the general public. It is difficult for the wealthy to justify spending. Uh, let's see if there are uh, millions or billions on art when their wealth could disappear. I think it's a symptom of capitalism where everything has to be created from a point of selling it, which negates a lot of potential artistic endeavors. Uh, million dollar extreme, for example. This has its pros and cons because back in the Renaissance, only the well-connected and established were privileged enough to see art, enter beautiful structures, hear music, whereas today everyone gets somewhat equal access to these arts, but that leads to competition for those resources of people's eyes and ideas which creates its own gatekeeping of sorts so uh there we go i'm curious uh paul what do you think yes, about paul. the state people want paul the chat wants paul <laughs> yes the chat paul, wants paul go. they love you paul uh I, i'm not I, I i'm not sure my problem with all this sort sort of thing goes way back because i treated this this problem in my book, you know, the, we, we talk about art now, but the word art now doesn't quite mean the same thing that it used to mean. People used to talk about the arts and there was, there was painting and there was sculpture and there was uh, etching, you know, all, all the different arts, including chair making, cooking, uh, uh, hairdressing, everything. So there was all these arts and these arts had a hierarchy. And for instance, you, know, you 
Well, I mean, and the hierarchy had to do with the expressive possibilities. For instance, uh, like roofing is an art. And so you can see in France, for instance, when they do make roofs out of slate on, and they have rounded roofs and all sorts of different pointed roofs. And so it, it's, it, it's artful in, in the sense of techne. <laughs> But it's not the same thing as painting because it's not giving you some kind of human expression. It's making something very beautiful and exciting and wonderful to have keeping rain out of your house. And it's very decorative and so on, but it, it's not telling you a, a human story. So the, there were the high arts, which were the most poetic arts. And then there were other arts which were perfectly respectable, but they were, they were on a, on a lower level and, and they, they had other purposes. And you know, life is not all about standing on top of a mountain, looking upward towards God with your arms out and having a, a light shine down on you. You also have to go down the mountain and go to the bathroom and eat something. And life is made up of a multitude of things. And these things have a hierarchy. And, and the word art now subsumes everything. There is no more painting. You know, Geo is trying to make real paintings and other people are trying to make real paintings. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and, and then other people are doing all kinds of things which are complete fake evil paintings, which are, <laughs> are being presented as art. Everything and ev anything is presented as art. And, and, and you can't say no to art. It's all art and it's all what, what anybody wants. You know, the pile of garbage, you know, on and on and on. And it's all art. And, and we can't be coherent about it at all. People used to talk about painting. And so you, then you have to talk about painting. And then painting gets subverted and people do all sorts of things with it or they do something that they call painting. It's all about prestige. It's all about having the prestige of, of this thing. And, 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 and that gets back to this Nietzsche and Heideggerian thing. We all have to be what I call uh, criminal artist prophets. You know, we, we've got to be criminals and we, we violate the old rules and we've got to be artists that we create something new and it's prophetic where we're creating a new future. And each little five-year-old scrawling on something is a criminal artist prophet. You know, we, we applaud their violation of on and on. And it's, it's ridiculous. And so we're just in a big nothing. And we've got to get back to the reality of things. Painting has laws and, and people who, who do stuff, you know, and then, the, so we talk about, for instance, uh, Martina brought it up about how, how the Catholic church used painting as a propaganda thing. And, and that's true. But the propaganda aspect is the propaganda aspect. And the painting aspect is the painting aspect. You can do that with painting because painting is expressive. It, it has something, you, you can say different, all kinds of different things with it. So you can do propaganda with it, but the propaganda is not the art, that's propaganda. And you, th those distinctions used to be made. And now we talk about the propaganda as if it's the art and it isn't. And, and those, those propagandists happen to be great painters and the, the propagandists of today are not great painters. I mean, they might be very inventive. They might do things which are appealing, but it's not painting. And are you talking they, about radiant. You're talking about like the skill behind it. Well, like the skill right. set of the artist. Right. Except, except uh, different different arts require different kinds of skills. Yeah. And uh, certain arts require a tremendous amount, not just a lot of skill, but require a, a, a certain kind of honing of the soul that other, that other arts don't require. But, and so there is a hierarchy of, of these things. And, and if that's not recognized, the, 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 the thing goes off the rails. I mean, I don't know, take, you know, I love comic books and cartoons and all those things, and, and I wouldn't want to live without them, but it's not Titian. You know, it's not Renoir. It, it's something else. And it's, yeah, it's but if you go to Reddit, uh, Marvel, the Marvel Universe is like a titian to them. Well, <laughs> well that, then you have to judge, then you have to judge people's taste. 
their, their reaction. I mean, someone who for whom Marvel is as high or more important or can, you know, okay, they appreciate that and that's great. But if they fail to appreciate something else, that's, you know, that's a lack on their part. And we, we can't make judgments like that anymore. We, we, there's no longer such a thing as a hierarchy of taste. I mean, there's nothing wrong with people loving whatever it is, but it's, it, it's, it's not as high as loving the most lovable things. But no, what's interesting, Paul, is that you're not, um, having watched a lot of your work, you're not like going on like very, you know, simplistic, like Paul Joseph Watson, like this was degenerate. Oh, like you're more because you, you grew up in a time and you have an appreciation for, for example, the New York school and you, for example, you were doing this one video about Philip Gustin and one of your favorite works by him is one of his most abstract works that has rhythm and, and light and, and it has a sense of movement. And it's, I think that's the difference because you're not just casting aside non-representation. It's more of the intent and the, um, and I do realize we live in the era of the death of the artist, but at the same time, I feel that uh, someone who was in the chat asked, it was Wander, uh, does Gio agree with Paul's on originality? Uh, I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of agree. I feel that in some ways it's not that originality is impossible, but the fetishization of originality is this like bullshit liberal individualist stuff that like Adam, what I mean by, I mean like atomized individualism where the artist has to be totally 100% original and you end up doing the same thing because you're known as that guy. Carol Dunham is known as cartoonish vagina guy. So it's like, I, I, I agree with Paul because every, Every original piece of art has a genealogy to it. It has a, 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 it's responding to a history and a purpose and a movement, and it's responding to what came before it and what will come after it. And therefore, I think that this fetishization of originality is, uh, it's well intended, but at the same time, people don't know what originality is nowadays. People look at like some bad, like for example, what you posted with the Trump, uh, the that. Neo, what I call neoliberal kitsch people would look at that and they're like wow that's so original man I've never seen that before you have you've seen it a million times in every single photography like every single photograph of like the fucking power sign in the Trump Tower you've seen it a million times but because someone did a bad copy tracing of it people think that that's some kind of like stunning commentary that's original on our particular time period when in actuality there is a whole variety of media forces that were contrived and concocted in order to make that this like stunning and brave image. So yeah, I, I do agree with Paul. I think that originality is only but one aspect of what makes good art because originality can become a total mind fuck where it's, <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't swear, but it, it becomes a total mind parasite where you're obsessing with, Oh, I look the same as this person, but in, in actuality, all great yeah. art come until very recently comes from this response in this genealogy. And well, this, well, look at anime yeah. for instance. Like a lot of anime, yeah, anime say, is oh, kind they, of like you that, know, it looks but... the same, but at the same time, like the amount of work that they put into it, and in the end, you do end up getting certain styles that, while they look the same, they become the very best example of a particular uh, a particular style. So there's something to be said about that. Now we have a comment from Super Iron Bob, the great Super Iron Bob, who says, "Remember to like the stream, thumbs up, everybody, thumbs up, like the stream right now, and also." subscribe break the rules is bringing back the salon with great conversations between people across all sorts of domains hell yeah you won't regret it and if you want to support the stream further there are super chats and paypal and crypto links in the description and patreon if you want to support on a regular basis god bless you super iron bob you heard the man super chat super chat super chats and in fact whatever super chat you write whatever question you ask we are going to answer it right here for you on the stream cream of dog is here i love cream of dog i love that character design of that dog man it is such a beautiful design it's so nice 
nice looking. It is just, and you could see it like even in your face, cream of dog. Like you have such a nice, like this is the first time we've ever met, but you have such a nice, like, I don't even know what to call it, like a spirit about you. You know what I mean? Like you just see. Uh, like, get out of here. What are you doing? Get these compliments out of here. You're too kind. No, I'm simping. I'm simping for, uh, for cream of dog. Cause you're, you're my dog, cream of dog. And, uh, you're my dog too, Paul talk. You're the man now, dog. You remember that movie, Finding Forrester? Uh, that was a good website back in the day. Anyway, I know I'm rambling right now, but the point is you got to subscribe. You got to help us grow, and we appreciate every one of you. So another thing that I'm curious about, though, which I think was kind of uh, not really picked up on, was do you think that we have already seen all the Medicis there are to see, and we're not really going to have any rich people anymore who care about you know, high quality art that would uh, actually invest in it like uh, time was invested back in the day to like, you know, bringing people like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo in, training them, giving them all the necessary tools and then allowing them to just create these wonders. Like, have we seen the last of this now? No more? Are you asking me? Yes. Um, well, I'm asking everybody, but in particular, Paul, I would love to uh, get you, get your opinion on this. Well, now we have, we're living in a world where the elite is corrupt and they have this uh, neo, neo Nietzschean, you know, vulgar Nietzschean, vulgar Heideggerian idea. And, and in contemporary art is, is their, is, is the equivalent for them. And, and what it does for them, it, it's not, something to glorify God or glorify their wonderful accomplishments or their, or to decorate their cities or to, you know, make things beautiful. It's to make a line of separation between themselves and the knuckle dragging hoi polloi who uh, vote for Brexit and vote, vote for Trump and who have to be eliminated. And, 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 and they can look at this stuff and say, we appreciate and understand this stuff. You know, the emperor, his clothes are so marvelous, and those fools can't even see it. So, but, what, it's, but wasn't it's the Rococo a, a kind marker. of like that back in the day, Paul? Well, not just the Rococo, but other People intelligentsia movements. No, right? no, like but I'm mean, I'm being an asshole. But, like uh, you know, I'm being facetious, but I, <laughs> I eventually we were going to get to this point about the Rococo, but uh, I, I no, well, I, you know. I, it, it, Styles are, are, are always their people are for them and against them. And then there's there's other things going on because there's personalities, you know, certain painters and they're attached to certain things. And, you know, it's like it's like what goes on with rock groups. And then the, the fans of different rock groups end up fighting or, or soccer teams or something. So th there's all kinds of other aspects that, that Limp come Biscuit versus uh, but, Slipknot. So, yeah. Oh, Biscuit any day. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, agree, I've always man. thought that Limp Biscuit and that Shrek guy was his name, Smash Mouth. I thought they were the same person. Oh, Fred they have a similar, <laughs> Yeah, they have a similar aura. I don't know why. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, go, go ahead. <laughs> well, that, that's also, we, we, we have the elite we have, and they have the, the metaphysical attitudes they have, and it's, it, it's going to produce what it's producing. And so if we're going to have beautiful things, we have to pull ourselves together and do them ourselves. But but do you think that so it's a different it's a different game it's a different. Hmm. But, but do you think what? that beauty is something beyond just um, something appealing or or kitschy? Beauty could also be horrendous, like a Biskinski painting or a Goya painting. I I don't know. I feel the reason I think contemporary art is worth looking at intellectually at least is that it tends to reveal where our culture is heading. And so when I look at, for example, Tracy Eamon, for, for instance, I feel that, you know, okay, Tracy Eamon, uh, you know, her dirty bed sheets and uh, plastering. Uh, uh, well, I mean, Tracy Eamon's a bad example because it's so like, that's to, even to the level of kitsch now because everybody knows Tracy Eamon. Uh, but let's say like, I don't know, Paul Arego will be a good example. Like there's some, or Giorgio O'Keefe or whatever. I feel that... I don't know. I feel that there's some value at least in looking at what the people that run this world believe in, in some respects. Well, well, but that, but that's something else. That's, that's mm. uh, saying where the, our society's going or where it's been or where it is, or saying what this, these elites think that it's not, 
It's not artistic. Those aren't artistic things. What, what's artistic is expressive power. Mm. And, and, and then, you know, I don't think that beauty is really an issue, say, in painting. It, 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 it could be, but it's, it's, it's the expressiveness. You, you, you're expressing something. You're, and it, and it's, it's, it's mysterious because you're not just making a picture. You're, you're showing something, but it's how you're doing it. You know, it's like, like this painting here that's, that I'm seeing on my screen. You know, the, 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 the colors, the quality of the colors and, and, and the way they're put on. And that, that speaks, you know, it's, it, it makes me think of the question of originality. You know, I, I think you can't get away from originality. It's like, it's like fingerprints or handwriting. Originality is, you know, it's there. E each individual is original. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a um, marker of our limitations in a way. But so, so and that can be interesting, but it's it, when, you, when you practice an art, the art of painting, the art of putting colors on a, on a surface and doing things with that, you, you are expressing something. And so if you express something that's, that's marvelous, in order to express something that's marvelous, you have to understand how painting works. And then you have to have something to say. You have to, you know, it has to, it has to go somewhere. And it, 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 it could be propaganda, but the propaganda aspect is just going to be annoying. <laughs> or it could tell something, a, a beautiful story, and, and you could love that. You know, like if you take a painting like um, uh, Titian's uh, Actaeon, Diana and Actaeon. It's a, it's a, it's a terrible story because it's a, it's about somebody getting killed. And yet, you know, you, you look at this painting, and is it beautiful? Well, it's got all those crazy brush strokes everywhere. And, you know, it's this it's this mysterious, wonderful thing that's such a great work of painting art. You know, and and we're just so far away from that today. You know, everybody's concerned with their with their you know, they, they've, they've got to create something, they've got to make their mark, they've got to, you know, most, most painters and artists and so on, the great mass of them all through history were anonymous, working away, doing beautiful things that, that we see, you know, walk around New York and there's all these anonymous Italian sculptors who are doing decorative work on these buildings and, you know, and, so it's a, it's a lower kind of art, but here these endless lives swallowed up in, in, in this stone carving. And now in the name of sculpture, people do things which are like, it's, it's as if they're spitting at all that. It's almost like a, look at me, everybody, look what I can do, as opposed to contributing to this, uh, like when you talked right now about the uh, New York City uh, buildings, it just reminded me how psychedelic these buildings really are. When I look around, like, honestly, such art never ever, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, sure, you could say Alex Gray was able to go into these worlds. I'm curious, actually, what you think about Alex Gray. We can get to that as well. Uh, are I don't you familiar know. I don't with his know work? No. I will show you, I'll show you some of his work then. Yeah, so he is cool. A, yeah, I'm he did the Tool albums. Without... You're what, Martina? I'm actually friends with Alex Gray. That's right. Oh, nice. Well, I went to... Uh, How much DMC have you done? <gasps> no, that's fine, because I'm from the Hudson Valley, uh, New York area near Woodstock. So he used to do these festivals at his, like, house to the... Uh, what are they called? But, yeah, and they used to drop DMT and do, like, light shows. And the oh, yeah, the full moon festivals in the, What's yeah, DMT? the chapel. Uh, it's dimethyl tryptamine. It is a chemical that's also produced by the body, but the it can world. also be made uh and um when you take dmt you go into a psychedelic realm that like personally i'm able to go into a much 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 lighter version of that realm through breathing techniques where you know you see the third eye you know you see that light in the very center of uh you know the mm -hmm. perspective line and you get to see mm -hmm. nets and you like in dmt you go to a world that people describe as being mm -hmm. realer than reality a world where basically like the reality that we're living in right now in comparison seems like a heavy sock 
that we take off. And it's <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've never done yeah. I've never done it, but uh, I from what I've read or heard about, I guess it's the same kind of chemical in the pineal gland that's produced like when you're dying. And so it's like, I don't know, this really intense feeling. Um, and is, is it similar to shrooms? Like the same kind of yes, thing going yes, on Yes, yes, it is brain? similar to shrooms. It's Al- significantly Al- more powerful, isn't it? Yeah, because and Aldous it's... Huxley said that taking shrooms was like uh, seeing like a like a mushroom or something or seeing a flower. Like when you look at a flower, it's like seeing it for the first time like Adam. It's just, it's so like magical, you know, and mystical instead of just like, oh, a flower. I'm on autopilot. It's just a flower. Well, like, oh, that... like these guys over here. So Paul, this painting it's a painting that he painted based on what he saw. So he is incredibly skilled when it comes to like, it's like a human f- photographer, but the photographer of the mm. mind's eye, because these guys over here, this didn't just come from, I think it didn't just come from his imagination. Oops. When I had the mushroom trip uh, back in the day and I did the breathing technique, I saw these same guys that he refers to as the uh, Godhead. And uh, it is a pretty interesting experience, but uh, I want to try doing it uh, without using any drugs at all so that I can develop it through my own body, as I'm always uh, talking about. But Alex Ray is an interesting guy. And I'm curious, Paul, what you think about this kind of art. It's very it's very different than what uh, people would normally associate with art. It's uh, it's the specific visionary art. But uh, l- let me know what you think. You Are you there, Paul? Paul went off, I think. I don't he know said why, oops, like, and then he oh. disappeared. Uh-oh. Yeah. It's the, uh, the the Godhead uh, probably did some spell. It, it cursed the stream showing off the Godhead. <laughs> so hopefully we're going to get Paul yeah. back. I'm going to see what exactly is going on. So I had a question to, to ask, so I hope, hope... Oh, shit, he's gone. He's, no, no, he, he is. He should, he should be coming back soon. I'm going to check up on what exactly is going on. But let me take this opportunity to say to all the people who are watching, are you thank you so much subscribe exactly i couldn't have said any better myself myself (laughs) thank you so much yes guys please subscribe right now i really appreciate everybody watching this thing and i want to get deeper into this conversation let's find where paul is so no one can you also contact paul and see what's going on maybe his battery ran out on the phone i'm not exactly sure is he using phone or laptop i would assume he would be using his uh smartphone yeah, that may be it. Maybe it just ran out of juice. So we're going to see how exactly we can go about this. But let's open it up right now to the rest of the panelists. So, Luke, any thoughts on the discussion so far about art? I know, like, you started drawing uh, how many years ago? Uh, I mean, I've been drawing since I was three. But honestly, I only got serious, like, five years ago. And I didn't go to school or anything. I had to learn it all on uh, on the computer, YouTube, and all that. So, come Different journey, different journeys, you know? It's also free. Exactly. Yeah, free, but it takes some time. It takes a little more time, I think. Discipline. Yeah, oh, I think... gotta be. Discipline. I think Paul is back over here. There's some sound going on. I also wanted to quickly say, uh, Martina, uh, I went to acting yeah. school with uh, with Zena Gray back in the day. Oh, really? Is that his daughter or something? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, I just talked to him on Instagram. He's a fan of Lady Alchemy. Um, nice. And I actually asked him if he wanted to participate in the magazine that I'm working on. I've been working on for a while, but it's coming together, and he seems to be really excited about that. So Nice. And what is the magazine called, if people want to check it out? It's called Virtus Lieber. Virtus, like B-I-R-T-U-S, Lieber, R-L-I-B-R, dot com. Uh, but it's going to be a print magazine. It's not an online thing because we got to get back to print. Um, I think especially with a lot of the censorship and all sorts of stuff on the Internet, it's not the uh, wild, wild west anymore of the Internet the information superhighway. So I feel like we should all start making real life tangible things now. And an old magazine is kind of fun. To- Agreed. Well, this is exactly why for our wonderful patrons, for our $20 patrons, you are going to get very, very beautiful looking wooden magnets that are created by my father, Alexander Polyakov. So one second, here we go. Okay, so this is the wooden texture of these magnets. Look at this beautiful wooden texture. These are completely original and you are going to get a magnet every year. Every year that you are a subscriber, you are going to get a magnet. And on top of that, if you become a $30 patron, you are going to 
get Giovanni Penicetti's beautiful prints. Look at him go. This is exactly how fast it takes him to create one of these prints. This is not fast forwarded. This is exactly how long it takes. And uh, when you become a $50 patron, you are going to get on top of all this stuff every year. You are going to get a completely original wooden magnet. Complete whatever you want. Well, I mean, not completely original. Commissioned. Commissioned wooden magnet. Whatever you want. In fact, I would love to show Paul Talk uh, some of my uh, father's work as well. If I go to alpstudio.com, I'm going to put some of these pictures and uh, show them to Paul. But anyway, I wanted to get back to Paul regarding uh, Alex Gray's work, if he had a chance to look at that. So, uh, Paul, can, uh, can you hear me? Can we hear you? Yeah. Um, um, listen, can I let, let me tune in in a couple of minutes. I'm helping my father out here and then I'll. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I'll, I'll jump back in. I'll jump Sounds back good. in. Okay. Sounds great. Right. I mean, this is great because we're all helping our fathers. Uh, Paul is helping his father and I'm helping my father when it comes to uh, showcasing his uh, his wonderful artwork. And I got him into uh, crypto art as well. But here, just real quick. In fact, maybe I could show it off this way. So here we go. Alpstudio.com. Let's see if this works. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. So you can oh, see nice. some of his artwork over here. A lot of this stuff is stuff that he did back in the uh, USSR. So this one over here, this is supposed to be Esmeralda with her uh, with her goat, and uh, uh, yeah, all kinds of all kinds of beautiful works. I think my dad's a real genius, and this is the kind of quality that you guys can get. And this is, by the way, my mom. So he drew my mom uh, back, I think, even before she had me. But uh, this this is her over here. And, I can see uh, the similarity there, Lev. Thank you. And uh, the wooden toys. He makes all these beautiful nutcrackers over here. Here is a rooster that he made. Look at the look at the quality on this rooster over Whoa, here. Whoa, that's rad. Yeah, beautiful textures over here on this wonderful rooster. And uh, as far as the commissioned uh, wooden things, like this is the kind of quality that you can expect. So go to patreon.com slash break the rules. I'm going to post the link in the chat for all you fellas and ladies to get in there, become a patron today. And I appreciate the hell out of every single one of you who is watching the stream. Don't forget to subscribe. And also for $50 patrons, Jules P. Hamilton is going to create beautiful paintings of what is that movie? I'm trying not movie that series 40 hammer 40 hammer 40k hammer what am i talking about how does it go am i saying hammer 40k is that it is that it am i totally confused luke help but me out warhammer. here buddy but what warhammer. Warhammer? Warhammer? warhammer i didn't even yeah. play i just know i don't remember uh. yes warhammer warhammer. i think it's warhammer 40k <laughs> you're yeah. almost there 40k yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's when Warhammer. you do DMT and play Warhammer. <laughs> oh, Lord. No, my dad doesn't do any DMT. I think the only thing he did once was weed. But other than that, like he did it maybe for like a week. He didn't touch anything like he didn't touch cigarettes, alcohol throughout his entire life. And keep in mind, this guy was surrounded by Russian bohemians who did all the drugs. They did all of them like they did, you know, Crocodile. Well, I don't yeah. know if Crocodile was Yo, around during that crocodile. time. Crocodile stop. Hey, no, 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 no. I'm sure. I could go I'm for sure some of that right now. Line at, I'm, I'm sure they drew the line at heroin. I pissed someone off in the chat. I fucking hate looking at chat. I wish there was a way I could ignore it. <laughs> the problem is, this Jay Willis guy is fucking brutal. He's fucking on to me. I don't know what it is. I pissed him Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Jay Willis, isn't that uh, Martina's friend? <laughs> well, of course yeah. it's Martina's friend. That's why, because I pissed you off, and now he's doing some like weird. No, we're all we're all friends. We're all friends no, over here. No, he's not friends with me. He fucking hates me. He's no, just, don't he's say a that. Simp. No, look, you don't even. Here's the thing: we don't even know each other this well. If we were meeting up face to face, it would be a totally different experience. I know, I know, but this so is the so I, I, I think. Look, I think that all of us like joking around, like pushing yes. each other's button. This is the nature yes. of the fucking internet. I know, I know. And at the I end know, of the know. day, we are all aspects of the Godhead. We are all these. Uh, fingers of the hand, of the arm, of the body, and yada yada yada. You know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know. I'm so... just very, I just, I'm very conscious of right the, the, the Colosseum, the Colosseum effect. Was it gladiators and shit understand. like that? And you got to win the, win the hearts of the crowd. I feel like that's yeah, very. Yeah, win the hearts and minds. And then when and I see way... shit like that, it's and like, Paul, yeah. I think Paul Talk is back. Paul, yeah, are yeah. you there? Are you with us? I'm here. Excellent. Let me quickly, by the way, show you some of my father's artwork. I know we did it before, but no, uh, I've, been, I've been looking at it. I love this. This is it, this is like one of those um, Russian things where you 
you open it up and it's another thing inside. Russian oh, the Matryoshka. Well, I don't yeah. think he did. Oh, actually, I think he may have done some Matryoshkas back in the day. But uh, this is Rasputin over here. This is his. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I but can see him out here. It's a similar or, technique of woodworking and painting. The... Uh, good, good question. So, uh, yeah, it, it, what you were saying, a similar technique of woodworking to the Matryoshka dolls? Well, there's, there's this that Russian tradition of, of painted wood things. Mm -hmm. no, that they, the rooster true. reminds me of, of it. And your, oh, yeah, your, father, your father was trained in Russia, I guess. He was, yeah. He was born yeah. in Russia. He was... Yeah. Uh, he, he, yeah, he. Well, we lived in Saint Petersburg, so he was around mm -hmm. Saint P Saint Petersburg for a long time. Jules says Lev is a real life Russian doll, Rasputin. I like that. <laughs> and this is a uh, this is by the way Paul the second, and this is the son of Catherine the Great. For those who are not aware, here let me uh, real quick just zoom in on this, and then we're going to move along. But uh, here, so take a look at these details over here. This is Paul the second. Look at this stubby little pig pig man pigman nose over here <laughs> and all these nice looking metals and you know this is this is good stuff so guys i am showing off my dad's artwork because i want you guys to become patrons patreon.com slash break the rules we are constantly growing we are constantly breaking new ground we are going to have on this stream uh, uh we're gonna have a uh, owen cyclops <laughs> we are gonna have owen cyclops on the stream i guarantee it it is happening in feb uh february so don't worry owen is coming on and uh, anyway let us transition back to the uh, btr chat window over here but also uh, Paul, what do you think about uh, Alex Gray's uh, work? I don't know if you had a chance to see it in the window earlier yeah, on. Yeah, I, I did. Well, no, the, the thing is that it's it's what, what shall I say? It's 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 not. I can't consider it painting. It's he's done this thing. He's he's uh, created this uh, fantastic. It's a gorgeous image that well it's it's uh, I, I you know it's it's something to experience but it, you know it, it's it's not to be for me it's not to be put in the category of painting which is you know not it's neither that's neither here nor there but it, it, it's um you know, I, I don't know how to react to something like that because you know, it's it, you, you could almost look at anything and, you know, how do you react to anything? And and this, in a way, is, is why Duchamp made the ready-mades. Because he, the, the ready-mades, he would go around, he, it took him years. You know, he, he only made, what, 13 of them. And he was, he was looking for something that, that had no aesthetic impact on him at all. It's, it's a, it was a game he's playing with, with himself because, in fact, everything is aesthetic. And th this is a problem with contemporary art because absolutely everything and anything is aesthetic. So you you can't because of that. If 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 you reduce art to aesthetics, then it, it becomes a problem because then there's you know there's nothing to choose from between all these things, and, and in a way. Duchamp, by creating the ready-mades, he was trying to, uh, ironically, and of course, like with everything that Duchamp did, it was uh, sort of spiritual in the French French sense. It was full of wit. It was, it, it was a way of reestablishing some kind of hierarchy. <laughs> you know, to, 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 there's some things that aren't aesthetic in some kind of way. Well, for, for those who don't know what we're talking about with the ready-mades, here are some uh, some of the examples. So you have a bicycle over here, a bicycle wheel that's on the table. You have the uh, urinal. So uh, these are the things you're talking about. There is only 13 of the urinal is not a ready-made, I don't think. Ah, um, interesting. Uh, the, the, there's only 13 of them. And... It took him years to make them, and no one ever saw them for 26 years. So one thing about Duchamp is that he wasn't trying to get famous or get rich. <laughs> and when he did these things that had become so important and which are so misunderstood, he was doing them for completely different reasons than 
the, the, than the people who are claiming Duchamp as the, the justification for what they're doing. And he even tried to he even tried to stop the neo Dada movement. He, 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 yeah, he it was. Uh, to, he was like poking fun at them, right? That's what he was no, trying to do. With no, them. no, because no, because Duchamp didn't make fun of anybody. You know, he. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, I mean, I mean, he, I mean, the urinal was a way of it was a, a tremendous dig at the Cubists. I mean, that's what the urinal was about. You know, people right. don't yeah. understand that at all. But, but I think uh, people he, take it seriously as if I think people take it seriously. Um, but I think and miss the point of what oh, yeah. he's trying to say. Oh, yeah. But it, he went to a, an opening of Rauschenberg where my art teacher, Aaron Curzon, was present. And he passed out a, a, a work of his, which no one talks about, called Raze. You can find it on the Internet. And it's it's the Mona Lisa without a mustache. Rase means shaved in French, <laughs> and it, the, the 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 I mean, if you're oh, sorry, if you're, how do you spell your teacher's name? K U R Z E N. You'll find nothing on the internet except if I've posted something, or you know, maybe a few little things. Yeah, I'm not finding it. I'm finding. Oh, I'm just gonna. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm just gonna paste in the chat what I found, just because. This is the extent of what oh, I was able to find. Oh, you forgot the other fifty dollar patron. Oh god, <laughs> oh, there he oh, is. That's right, Geo. Tell us about what the fifty dollar patrons are going to get, as well as the, all the stuff that we listed. My mass-produced Bob Ross uh, acrylic on paper sketches that I do. These are so amazing, guys. I, I cannot They're not I cannot amazing. Believe... It takes me literally 10 minutes to do. No, but don't no. say that. Don't, don't spoil it. Don't spoil don't it. Don't spoil no. it. No, throw up the images, Lev. One of them recently I sold to my buddy Apex, who is a friend of the show. But uh, no, I've been hearing the chat. Um, I think, Lev, I know I'm going to get some heat from this about Alex Gray. But I know where Paul is coming from. Because my problem... <sighs> Well, besides the fact that Vinoza is a better painter, but like, I mean, I can't say which one's a better painter because Alex Gray was the chief um, for the Harvard Medical School was the chief illustrator for all of their diagrams for in the, in the eighties. So he has a uh, intimate knowledge of human anatomy as an artist. But the thing I want to problematize is that I've called it psychedelic kitsch before <laughs> because I feel that it's not... <sighs> It is art, but it's not, um, it's not like fine art. It, it is fine art, but it's more so illustration in the sense that he is, Alex Gray is transcribing an experience that he's had on a uh, psychedelic level. And it's more for, I would say, similar to, oh yeah, there's one of them. Uh, the, it's similar to, I would say, the art of the, uh, Chinese literati painters or Zen Ensos or um, certain forms of indigenous art in that it is trying to use art as a spiritual practice similar to later on uh, they, you know, the various psychoanalysts bastardized with art therapy. So in that sense, it's not within the same context as even other mystical artists such as Nikolai Rorish who had a grounding within art training, but Alex Gray, he's using his art for a different purpose. And I hate to say it, but unfortunately Alex Gray has become a brand. And mm. the reason I call it psychedelic kitsch is because very easily ready made for uh, 3d art installation pieces, uh, not traditional uh, gallery spaces, but rather it's very easy to sort of uh, lend itself the way that folk art lends itself to like tattoo culture and things like that uh and graffiti art it's very much outsider it's very much art brute but at the same it's not art brute in the sense that it's simple uh but i feel that i don't know uh, alex gray his earlier works were very technical and very technically proficient uh and very incredibly elaborate but it seems that the stuff he's producing recently, it's part of the brand. Like, you know it when you see it. Well, well you see yeah. over here what I, I posted right I now, agree. right? I agree, too. Oh, sorry. I wanted like, to I'm not going to lie. Alex Gray is a big influence on me, the way that Venosa yeah. and other uh, visionary artists. Well, I just had two uh, points about what you were saying when you were talking, Gio, that I wanted yeah, to 
get to. Uh, one of them was uh, about this spiritual kind of artwork stuff. Uh, that's that's kind of how I created Lady Alchemy was for that purpose as well was to kind and also dance is uh, is I mean, it's trance to me. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's very spiritual kind of thing, too. You can just lose yourself when you hit that. Like it's like an athlete when they're in the zone. Like no one can deny it when they're around you and you're in that zone, it becomes a trance and uh, there is something spiritual about it. And I wanted to, you know, project those alchemical archetypes like in that art form. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of how I connect with that. But as far as the brand stuff goes, <sighs> something similar to um, an, you know, a real life friend of my artist friend of mine, uh, I don't know if you know, Mark Kastabi, he does something in, uh, similar to uh, Alex Gray. And I think what, other artists have done too. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what other art, artists in history, something like Picasso, some famous like artist types, but they end up like, <laughs> I don't know what you guys think about it. I don't know what Paul thinks about this, but they end up having like a factory and they just pump out artwork because that, and that ends up paying the bills. And so yeah, they just come in and they have a factory, they have assistants, they have people doing his technique in their way. And then they come in and just sign their well, Paul their name. Rubens was doing the same thing, right? Paul Rubens. He had a factory like well, how lot, many Paul lots Rubens? of artists. Lots of right. artists. Titian had one, yeah. But I feel Titian that less so, but yeah. But, uh, well, his students became like big in their own right. But yeah, I, I I think Wander Paul is internally cringing right now. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like Andy Warhol, uh, to quote uh, Robert Hughes, is the like quintessence of that artist as market brand mm -hmm. but he did it i think for strategic trad cath reasons i wrote an essay about andy warhol a few years ago uh where people i feel like he was the last one to do it well where he was taking art the concept of the art factory and and reflecting modern culture back onto itself in terms of mm -hmm. shameless consumerism but at the same time the people that came after andy warhol like it's just zombie formalism at this point there's people that yeah, but, 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 but again and... that's that's so that's sociology mm -hmm. you know it, it, it's because in what way is it painting in what way is it sculpture in what way is a are the is the brillo box a sculpture you know, then you can say, well, you know, it's, it's piled up and then, you know, but that's not what it's about. It's about it, it, it's about taking uh, something which is supposed to be this serious, you know, museum quality uh, thing and making a statement about American consumerism. You know, so it just it becomes something else. So my problem with this, even with the uh, that other image of the. Uh, what Alex Gray is his name? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the problem is calling it art. The, it, it, the pretension starts to ruin everything. Where where it mm -hmm. you know because it's it's this gorgeous thing. It's a gorgeous thing. You know you you like it or you don't like it. It's it's like this incredible uh, Peter Max poster turned into uh, you know, something else, and. You know, okay, Peter Max. I mean, you know, Peter Max made posters, and they're good posters. If you like that sort of thing, you can't compare it to Renoir. You know, it's, it's like it's and it, it and it shouldn't be compared to Renoir. It, it's its own thing. It's it's got its quality. It's on a lower level. That lower level exists. It has its importance. It has its value. You know, it's the point is not to put things down. The point is to understand the nature of things understand what they are you know we you know, it's it's uh it, it, like slapstick comedy is not shakespeare i mean and there's comedy in shakespeare you know 12th night these things are on different th these things are on different levels it's it's not about you know you, you can't talk about uh you can't talk about judgment without it becoming a huge problem in, in our time and so everything has to be great so there's this tremendous pretension Everything is art and it's all this stuff. And whereas, you know, whereas there are so many things that if they couldn't be called art, if you couldn't say this is art, if you couldn't pretend that it was art, it wouldn't exist. That's, mm. that's the problem. That's the problem because people wouldn't bother with it for one instant. That's people, pretty, so people, it's pretty harsh, <laughs> but no, I, yeah, I get what you're saying, but, uh, but I don't know, Paul, are you opposed to uh, selling, your art, your paintings on cruise ships like Peter Max, or uh, is, <laughs> is that something no, I mean, you I, do? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, why not? I mean, 
that, that selling stuff is a, is a different issue. Well, it's a whole different issue. And it's, well, you know, and even, even in, you know, everybody has to confront the problem of making money one way or another. It's a privilege if you don't have to. And, you know, and you, you can't look down your nose at somebody who makes money. You know, it's, it's a whole different issue. It's, it's like w- when things become propaganda or, or, the, the different kinds of messages or the different kinds of uses that painting or sculpture or the different arts can, can be uh, channeled into. It, it's a different, it, these are non-artistic aspects. And with our new, with our new definition of art, we're, we're, into the, we're into this confused world where we can't see anything clearly. And, and so we have these confused conversations where, you know, where if, if you, if you don't, if you don't take things with a certain kinds of seriousness, people people are offend, offended because their 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 personhood is being attacked because that's what gives them importance. You know, they're artists. They're 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 doing their creative thing, and it's it's sad, really, because you know we're, we're all children of God. We all have our importance, and. So, so, so people are giving themselves the, the, this, this fake importance, you know. And, and if if we want to be very serious painters, you've got to be very humble because you know there have been these tremendous accomplishments, and you have to become a slave to the thing, mm-hmm. and you you have to love it, and you do it. I mean, even if you make a success and so on, you 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 have to love it. You have to. You, so, if you love something, you give yourself to it, and. You know, so it, it, there's got to be a, re- a relationship like that. And, and uh, all right, well, okay. Yeah, I think my, my <laughs> favorite of, term, you know. <laughs> my a lot of these artists nowadays, my favorite term for it comes from professional wrestling. They're basically marks for themselves. They're marks for their own ability. Um, no, I, I agree. I think, yeah, the issue isn't selling per se, but it's, I, I think when, you know, your video that you made recently I think if people watch it, they, they get a sense of, um, you, you know, you mentioned Peter Max, for instance. Uh, or I don't Carol think I mentioned Dunham. Peter Max. Oh, Keller, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're like the blurring of the line between illustration, cartoon, and art, and the art, the art world. That's something like nowadays cartoony, cartoonish perversity has become like this high art form. Like even the artists themselves, has this air of like, if I say the right things, I'm going to get ahead. Like who's that guy in, in the UK that won the Turner prize in the nineties? Uh, Grayson Paul, Paulson Gray. Oh, what's his name? The, the cross dresser, uh, <laughs> Grayson Perry. Oh, oh. Yeah, there you go. Uh, people like that, that create, or like uh, Daniel Quinn that does the blood sculptures and, and it's all of this uh, symbolism. I get what they're doing, but, I, I don't know. I I agree with you. I think that there there isn't. Um... Yeah, if they, if they couldn't if they couldn't call it art, if there weren't people taking it seriously as art, mm, it, mm-hmm. they wouldn't do it. Oh, but what do you exist? think of uh, this uh, comment from uh, Kyle or yeah. Kel, uh, one of our great patrons? He asked, "Why does he insist on saying these things aren't art instead of just saying they're bad art?" or the artistic experience of viewing these things is shallow? Why don't I say that they're bad art? Well, the, the thing is, we, we, we'd have to get back into a whole other mindset where the word art could be used correctly. And we're so far from that. <laughs> that, I mean, because something could be you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's some things like, I don't know, certain things that are, it's a question of seeing things for what they are, for what they, what they really are. Poetry, dance, painting, sculpture, drawing, musical composition, musical performance at the highest level. These are, these are the arts where humanity can express itself with the most finesse and the most power. And then you have 
you know, rug making and stuff. And, and there are, there are gorgeous rugs. There's, you, you know, you go into a rug store and you see these marvelous things. Well, you know, it's something else. It's something else. It, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's this gorgeous thing, but it's not, it's not the same. It's not the same thing. It's, it's, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's this beautiful house decoration. It, and, and it's, it's, it's on a different level. It's, it's serving a different thing. So it's art and it's excellent art of the type that it is, or it's not so good. You know, you've got a better rug and a worse rug, but you can no longer distinguish between a gorgeous Iranian rug and, you know, the, the latest painting that, that someone out of art school has just done that's, you know, 10 by 10 feet and, you know, it's all art and it's all, you know, and what is it? And so we are forbidden to, from, from making what used to be ordinary distinctions and, and, and to see things for what they are because we're in this tremendous world of pretense where everybody has to be some kind of uh, living God. Uh, it's, uh, it's wrecking everything. And, you know, this, I, I don't want to change the subject, but it's the same thing as the transgender thing, all of this. It's the idea that we can be and do anything. It's we Gnosticism can... at the end of the day. Well, yeah. Mm. But what's strange to me about, let's say, that idea of uh, Gnosticism is that if you were to take Gnosticism uh, into a slightly diff different direction of saying, like, there is a truth out there that you are capable of experiencing like obviously you i think would have to do a lot of work and ascend spiritually to a higher state before you're able to even understand what it is compared to it you're like a dog or a goldfish so that's what i never understood about uh, when people call this kind of stuff narcissism because it's like if people are going to be dumb asses in life then why would they make good gods they just make shitty gods so why would you ever want to put yourself in the position where, oh, my God, I'm free now. I could do whatever I want. Well, you don't know what to do with that responsibility. So what are we even talking about here? That's see, that's my big problem with all this, where I'm not denying that maybe there is something to this Gnosticism thing. I know it's heretical, whatever, but I'm not denying that there are another truths there to discover. But the idea that people is in the state that most of them are in, and that includes all of us. If we were to get to that, uh, to the point where we have as much powers as a god or whatever, you know, that would be very destructive because we are all we are all messed up one way or another. You know, we're all carrying our own crosses. Uh, I, I, I have to drop out for a minute. I'll, I'll be back. I've been listening. I'll be back. Yeah. Sounds good. And guys, while he is dropping out, don't forget once again. You know me. Don't look at this chicken. Don't look at this chicken. Fuck. You know me. I love Pr Subscribe I love right now to break the rules. We are the greatest, most underrated mm. channel of all time. Tomorrow, we are going to have Afina Hyatt coming in later in the afternoon for a stream that I am doing uh, in the morning. This is radio. This is me taking over for Chris Tan's uh, uh, The uh, Rundown Live. And this is going to be BTR on The Rundown Live. And this is happening from 12 noon Eastern to 3 p.m. And it's a radio show. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have, uh, we are going to have several other people there. I believe we're going to have Calf Defender in as well tomorrow. And I'm going to post the link right over here in the chat. So all you guys, don't forget to go there. Set a reminder. Set a reminder tomorrow for 12 p.m. Eastern noon. And that's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a great time. I look forward to having you there, and it's gonna allow me more of a chance to uh, speak with all you guys and figure out what's going on in your life and also what's going on in my life, cause uh, we're all evolving, we're all we're all changing for the good by talking to each other. You get the yeah. idea here. Yeah, Here's definitely. a link: YouTube.com radio stream dawn of the second day i mean it's kind of like it's not even a, count, a countdown to the uh the sixth 
because tomorrow is the sixth, and that's going to be a big day. So dawn of the second day, there's going to be dawn of the third day, which is going to be Thursday, which is another one of these radio things. And on Thursday after that, we are going to have Alexander Bard back on, and we are going to have Arash Kolahi talking with him, as well as Afina Hyatt, who's going to be joining in on the fun. So there we go. Uh, and uh, let's see what else. Oh, Afina versus Martina. I don't know, Martina. Would you do like an Afina versus Martina show? What does that mean? Athena I don't know. I don't know. You guys just talking really with cool. each other about stuff. Yeah. Really cool. Sure. Yeah. Have Have you guys communicated before? Or no. No. Who Who Who? I like. I thought you were talking about the goddess Athena. <laughs> no, 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 not Athena. No, uh, Athena. Athena Hyatt. <laughs> so Athena Hyatt. She is now the uh, uh, Mrs. Charles Carroll. So Charles Carroll of MDE. I know you. You've never. Uh, here i'm gonna post for twitter so uh, follow her on twitter guys she's she's wonderful here it is afina hyatt twitter.com slash afina hyatt here uh, here she is and uh yeah follow her and also follow uh follow martina on twitter as well follow everybody yeah so afina versus martina i think that would be a fun a fun show if you guys are i mean check her stuff out and uh yeah maybe maybe we can do something there you know, speaking of Afina and Chuck, uh, we showed Paul some MDE like a few months ago. Oh. Paul, do you remember that? Do you remember Million Dollar Extreme? Does that ring a bell? Sort of. What was it? Uh, it was like a, uh, I sent you like an archive.com link to like a really kind of like fringe, strange, uh, like skit show. Um I think you said it was fairly nihilistic. That's why you, you said you get through it completely. But uh, I have a feeling, <laughs> I have a feeling oh, uh, Paul and post MDE Chuck would get along quite a bit. <laughs> which, uh, wait, which episodes of MDE did you uh, show Paul? I believe it was just like the first one. I linked him the whole series. I think he watched, he kind of skimmed through some of it. <laughs> yeah. My favorite episode was the, well, a lot of them are great. I like the baseball one with the dads. I mean, we talked about all that stuff on that stream. And by the way, guys, check out our Charles Carroll stream. That was a great one. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed the, the time there. So uh, as, fa as far as this conversation goes, we've talked about the Renaissance. We've talked about what you consider to not really be art. As far as, let's say, the art of the future goes, as far as digital art goes, do you see digital art as being the start of the future, new art, or do you think that digital art would not qualify as art in the way that you see it? By digital, I mean done like with a Wacom tablet and uh, you know, all, well, all the digital devices. The thing is, the medium doesn't matter. But, um, but digital art is always going to lack something. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> which, is, which is the physicality of the painting. You know, so it, it, it can have all kinds of values. It can all ha it can have all kinds of painting values, but it, it can't have the beauty of the object. It, I mean, I guess there's a certain kind of beauty that a screen can have, but that's that's a mechanical thing. It it, it start it's it to that to that extent it becomes like a photograph, which which has something mechanical. There's a, there's this there's this interface of, of, of something mechanical. So it's a problem. I wanted to say something else about Gio's 10 minute paintings. Do you know the story about Whistler when he painted the uh, fireworks painting and then he, he got sued by, by uh, Ruskin for throwing yeah. a pot of paint. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so there was a, there was a trial and then I, I'm saying this because of what Gio said. And then, so Ruskin said, how long did it take you to, because apparently it took him 10 minutes to paint the painting. And then, so Ruskin asked him, how long did it take you to paint that painting? And he said, my whole life. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, painting a painting in 10 minutes, that doesn't mean it's bad. No, no. When It, 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 it took yeah. you your whole life to do it. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, when it comes to plein air, especially, uh, but no, these are like Bob Ross copies. So, well, uh, well, whatever, whatever it is, yeah. you know, I mean, if it's, I mean, that painting I saw, I like it better than Bob Ross. You got some nice red up into the sky mm. and the stuff mm. he never does. It's yeah. got, it's got a little more, uh, <laughs> that, it's got a little more grit to it. I like Bob I, Ross. Yeah. Oh, by the way, like, speaking, 
I like that's why I like uh, Bill Alexander better than Bob Ross, who Bob Ross totally ripped off from. Oh, did I say that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, and by the way, speaking speaking of grit, I I made this presentation before, and I'm gonna make it again. I am gonna do calf raises, and if you tell me how many calf raises you think I can do, and how much money you're gonna bet on it, watch me go. I will do those calf raises because we gotta raise money for this stream, and I will do these calf raises. So write in the chat how many calf raises do you think I can do, and we will get it done. That is a guarantee, my friends. Post oh. physique. Yeah, Post well, physique. my physique. Look, look. Let, let's be honest here. Luke Valentine is mogging all of us, just sitting over here, not doing oh, anything. We can tell. The phone, we can man. tell the level of physique that, that he has. No, 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 no. Don't, don't even get me started. But this is the start for. This is the start for me. I'm gonna do P90X. I am gonna go oh, all yeah. the way. I am going to become. You are going to see a very different Love Polyakov uh, by the time summer arrives. I am going to shed the skinny, bone-like skeletal structure, and I am going to grow plumes of musculature thanks to all the work that I'm going to be putting in. But the only way that I can do that is if you subscribe to the stream, and you guys can get my legs strong once again by telling me how much money you think you're going to put in and how many of those uh, uh, leg things you think I can do the uh calf raises so let me know and uh yeah that's just what i wanted to say about that i'm, I'm looking at luke's uh i'm looking at uh some of luke's pieces uh the w let's see what's the what's a good one the angel blood one is very much similar to art nouveau uh it's quite quite interesting but there's this one he has of this house called neighborhood haunt but i i don't oh, know i feel like damn dude too, you're really digging it's too um it's kind of too not safe for work for the chat, but it's yeah, like a little really bit. It's a little out there. It's I, I love it because it's reminding me of like uh, the real house is destroying like this, like the, the sort of cardboard cutout, like movie set houses. Mm. Uh, and it's like this picture of destroying domesticity, the way that uh, those photographs, it reminds me of those photographs of women wearing these cutouts of houses that Lori Simmons does. By the way, Lori Simmons, the wife and of Carol Dunham, I think she's a way better artist than Carol Dunham. But uh, it, this monster in this house, just destroying this village, it, it almost reminds me, like you're doing this pink, uh, you're subverting the pink pastel aesthetic, which I really like. Oh, yeah. And uh, there's this other one, Muck Vendor, which is like the old hag archetype that is, uh, you've made, I don't know, it's really crazy. You got the balloons. I mean that's that's safe for work. You could throw that one in the chat, Lev. Muck vendor. It's really I'm really digging the color scheme uh, on it. But um, <laughs> and uh, also if you could find a safe for work Martina photograph, which I'm sure you probably could. But I don't know. Yeah, some of them are quite. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, yeah. If you go to Lady Alchemy, that's where all my artwork is. I don't really do too much art on the Martina account. Hmm. I have a question for like Paul, but it's generally for the chat. How do you find like it's kind of related to art, but how do you find purpose in like stuff? Like in terms of art and art or art and all the creation? Because I have like really bad habits of creating stuff because I, I feel like I don't really have like a purpose and I feel like there's something that other people have that like I haven't I have an amount of spirit, but I don't have this kind of something I don't know, like some kind of this thing of us have i don't know the, the thing the thing you showed earlier yeah it, it's got a lot of strength but you don't know what to do with the strength <laughs> yeah i mean that's kind of also i need for painting in particular i need like to learn how to use a small brush but i don't have any small like proper well, fine I, I don't know ones. i don't know if it's that there's no there's no need for small brushes you see in my case i grew up my father was a it's painter. Not the size I always of the brush. Wanted... Yeah. <laughs> I, I always wanted to be a painter and then I knew other painters and I got into it and then I started discovering painting. And so painting meant all that stuff to me. And so then it all became a matter of playing that game for me. So th that's that's my motivation. So I I was you know, I was nourished by by all those things, and 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 that's become taboo. It's no longer. It's it's seen. You know, for instance, learning how to draw is going to destroy your creativity. 
studying art history is just going to confuse you and you know you got to you got to be an original creator i i think one has to get rid of that all the that originality stuff am i am i still here no. i guess yeah you're still there you're still there and, and i'm listening and, and you know you, 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 if if you want to if you want to paint then you have to if you want to make paintings if the, the idea is if you want to make art in the sense of art today then it's it's just totally open and you mm. you you know you've just got to spill out your guts somehow do something you know pile one thing on top of another or or whatever what do you think you about paint, writing what do you think about writing in terms of the art sphere like the, the same it's the same thing you know the, the writing is not as off the rails as painting but it's mm. it's pretty well off the rails you know and, and, and there again you know, it's these things aren't easy. You know, they used to say that it took 10 years to make a painter. And that's when they were apprentices going into master's studios and getting serious training and working with the masters. And, and even then it took 10 years. So, you know, that's it's like becoming a brain surgeon. So it's something you have to give yourself to and you've got to find out what it is. And and, and if you're if if you feel the impulse of wanting to paint, for instance, or sculpt or whatever it is, then you you have to go immerse yourself into what this thing is because it's not, I mean, there's something natural about these things, but mm -hmm. we are not in the situation of naturalness. We're in the situation of, of living in this tremendous civilization, which we're now trying to destroy. But you can either be part of that destruction or, or you can be part of, <laughs> part of, mm -hmm trying to trying to be part of it you know and and that's so that's what motivates me you know i want to i'd like to do a painting which if one day it was in a museum or in some place and it was next to this painting by an old master i wouldn't be ashamed and so it it's a you know it's kind of a quest it's a it's a yeah I, I feel so bad asking this to Paul, but I figure uh, we owe it to the stream. Here goes Geo. I'm sorry, man. Um, Paul, what do, what do you think of uh, what do you think of this? That's a masterpiece. That's a great, <laughs> no! wonderful, Don't! eternal masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Not with a fucking sonnet you. <laughs> that is oh! art. That is art. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! Uh, are you familiar Paul with knew. Chris Chan? Wait, are, are you familiar <laughs> with Chris Paul Chan, knew. Paul? Do you know no. about Chris Chan? All right, I'm gonna have to no. send you the documentary because there, there's this guy. <laughs> uh, you want him to watch ten hours? <laughs> no, man, it's like thirty hours. It's now. thirty hours. Now, <laughs> Chris Chan. No, it's not like, complete yet. It's still going. Hours. Oh yeah, and, and I so, eagerly so, await each upload. Yes. So Chris Chan, so Paul, Chris yeah. Chan has been more documented than any individual on the, in the entire planet, more documented mm -hmm. than any like historical figure you can possibly think of. Probably more documented <laughs> than the Bible, as far as the amount of things that have been written about this oh guy. Oh my God. <laughs> and so, so c can you guess, by the way, Paul, without saying anything else, can you guess what are, what is that character that you just saw right now? Well, it looks like it looks like Sonic, but yellow. Okay, that's good. yes, exactly, Ex exactly. He nailed it because he took Sonic the Hedgehog and he took Pokemon and he oh, put them Pikachu. together to make Sonic Chew. It's it's, 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 it's Sonic Chew. <laughs> yeah, and it's a totally okay. Here's what happened. So he was supposed to have some kind of an art thing at school where they were supposed to draw original characters for it. So before he wanted to draw like Pikachu uh, or Sonic, I don't remember which one. They said no, you can't do that. It must be an original character. So he just combined. I was <laughs> I was going to do a video where I was going to review some of the better pieces by Chris Chan and compare them, like his one painting where. Uh, Sonichu and Rosichu are having sex under a tree. I was going to compare that to Gogan's uh, bathers, so the Tahitian women. So that to the extreme. A oh, that father. the famous that was from the first edition. Uh, go Sonic, go out and zap to the extreme. I will. There, there's someone that actually made that into a decent comic, like like that picture. They like where Chris Chan is like all buff and stuff, 
and he's like, uh, <laughs> and Sonic, she's like, I will, father. Like, <laughs> oh, here, I, I found the exact picture you were talking about. Here it is. But the other interesting thing about Chris Chan, for those who don't know, I mean, I'm sure everybody here knows. That okay, one! Yeah. <laughs> Paul, you're a Dragon Ball Z fan, is that right? Well, I. Uh, yeah, I guess you could say to that. an extent. <laughs> well, I, 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 I saw, I've seen a lot of Dragon Ball Z. I, 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 I haven't seen a lot of the first section, which I'd like to see, but I haven't. Dragon yeah, Ball, I, you know. Uh, what do you think of the art style there, Akira Toriyama style? Well, you know, it works for what it is, and you know the the. the the cloth is so, sort of, sort of <laughs> made of made of silly putty, but you know it's okay. It it works. You know, and, and I I actually I've seen documentaries about how the the different artists and the different production problems they've had and how the quality goes up and down. You know that, that that's a that's an interesting thing. You know it's it's industrial art really, mm. and it depends on all sorts of things, and it has to be judged for what it is. And it's the thing is it it, it has um, it has a certain poetic quality, you know, and it's it's not it's not high art, but it's a it's a, a it's a low kind of art of a captivating kind. You know, I was captivated captivated mm -hmm. by it. Those you know the the the, the battle epic battle with Freezer and you know. Well, you're talking about the anime right now, probably, or are you talking about the manga? Well, the the yeah, the anime they, because well, in the anime, you know, I'd say that the quality, even though they do retain the art style, it's a little bit lower quality than the yeah. uh, manga. So I right, think that right. uh, the the manga is just drawn better. But uh, mm. when it comes oh, to love that kind with of art, the esoteric it's anime like, right here. Well, opinion. we're, we're going to get to Sonic the Hedgehog <laughs> later on. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about the esoteric meaning of Sonic. But anyway, um, when it but comes also to Dragon in, Ball, in, in, yeah. Well, in in the manga, you know, I've, I've seen some of those. That's also industrial art. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. I agree, but it's like it reminds in me Japan, a lot of especially a... very much is industrial art. Yeah, well, it's yeah. like I'm not gonna put it, you know, next to uh, you know the great artists of the time, but I'm gonna put it next to let's say Windsor McKay, like Windsor McKay, Little Nemo, things of that. Oh, nature, Windsor which... McKay, Windsor Windsor McKay is, uh, you know, I I, I don't want to put down Dragon Ball. I spent hours watching it, but but Windsor McKay is something very special. Hmm. Well, no, it's, for, it, for the time, though, I mean, he was making these illustrations that were like the comics of their time. So I'm just curious, like, where you see the difference between Windsor McKay and Akira Toriyama as far as uh, as far as that goes. Well, it's it's uh, the, the the whole anime thing is 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 much more perfunctory. It's much more based on formula. And it, it's, you know, it's. It's it's accomplishing certain things. It's aimed at a certain audience. You know, it's not as. I mean, I re I really I really enjoyed Dragon Ball, but it's you know, Windsor McKay. The it's it's about as poetic as that kind of thing can get. It's, no, that is a good point. I'm not saying that they are exactly the same. I'm just curious, well, like they're, they're, whether they're, you would put Windsor McKay also in a similar type of uh, industrial. Art, well, like yes, art of course was... it's industrial. Of course, you know, for instance, he everything had to be a certain size. There had to be one a week. He he could use certain colors. So it's, you know, there, there's all these constraints which, which tend to, you know, it, it, you know, there's there's these time constraints and so on. So it has a certain that kind of art has a, a certain kind of crudeness. It, you know, we could talk about other people, you know, Jack Kirby or or, mm -hmm. or Harriman or, you know, there's, there's all these wonderful, wonderful artists who, who are doing this sort of thing. Have you seen, by the way, uh, uh, the artist who made a parody of Little Nemo in Slumberland called Little Ego, uh, Vittorio Giardino? No, no. I will I will send you a stuff. I think I think you'll like him. I mean, you guys may All not right. be that far away. He's probably somewhere in Italy or probably uh, well, you're oh, yeah. in France. So you get you guys mm -hmm. should meet up. But one last Chris Chan masterpiece I wanted to share with you. This is probably my favorite one of all. Well, the oh, empty head one is probably well, my favorite. What is this it? one? 
what the son that you run you don't need you don't have to tell me twice but during the stone age like i would just mm -hmm. love to have this on my wall just print this out just, i feel so like chris chan is in the category of outsider artist or art brute that people are fascinated with in terms of like mentally insane people people that make art in institutions like john wayne gacy or like people like henry darger who create these elaborate autistic inner worlds that people have faint access to until they die but only christian has the benefit of the internet so as someone said <laughs> as someone said in the gino samuel documentary uh usually autistic people have their art shoved in a drawer somewhere but the christian had the hindsight to put it on the internet so now we like know about sonichu and it's like this outsider art one of my favorite pieces was um and this is why I want to do a video on Chris Chan. Uh, or I might, if I come up with a sub stack, I'll like have a review that's more serious. Um, where Chris Chan has this piece where he has like a cutout of his head that is like a little guy that's like lying on the bed. And it says, I can't think of anything. My mind is a blank. And I, I'm like, man, you have Escher, you have the Dali. You have automatism, you have Chris Chan. So it's like, there you go. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was actually pretty profound for him. I feel yeah, like. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the most interesting thing about Chris Chan to me was the, whenever he was a child, that animatronic bear that mispronounced mm. his name God in the in bear, the shopping yeah. mall <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese. Led him to permanently change his name for the rest of his life. Yeah. That was a foundational <laughs> moment. Uh, it's funny how I've, I've always wondered that that was the moment that um, made Chris Chan unique and original in the sense that he was always like a band hopper of trends. Like he was a brony, then he was a furry or rather he was a furry, then he was a brony, but he never became like a new atheist when it was really popular. I think because of the God and the bear thing where I, and nowadays he has this like crazy uh, transgender, merge. Yeah. yeah, dimensional merge combined with, I would call his yeah, the merge is on. The merge is on, uh, combined with his transgender metaphysics, where he possesses a female soul and a male lesbian soul. So uh, he's a male lesbian now. So um, yeah, yeah, first he was a Tom girl, now he's a male. He's lesbian. a Tom girl. Yeah. Yes. Tom girl. And here's the picture, by the way, that you were talking about, Gio. Here he is. My mind is a blank. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Like, <laughs> it kind of, yeah, it kind of looks like there's water over here, like water in his brain. Oh, and it's the same inside. That is genius. Look at that. There's like a little him inside of the little it's, him. And it's fractaling. It's fractaling. Yes, it goes. <laughs> It's like Alex yeah. Gray. You know? no, I don't think people would be attracted to Chris Chan's stuff if not for there being this spark of genius inside there. Like I don't think yeah, like, there I are think... people who put out, you know. But but I wanted to ask Paul, what do you think of performance art? Because some people say that Chris Chan is like a performance art. Although I don't know, he's he doesn't have the intentionality of performance art. But I don't know. I I feel like. It is a symptom of post-modernity that these blends and these styles converge and create their own worlds, uh, or rather the distinction between, as Jameson said, between high art and low art is destroyed. But I think there is a space for performance. It's just that, like I mentioned to you in the YouTube comment, I said that nowadays performance artists are creating their own religions like uh, Marina Abramovic. So I, I wonder, <laughs> I think the fact that they have to create their own religions around performance art sort of uh, i don't know maybe well martina you're a performance artist so maybe you could shed light on this like what is it about performance that is it just that it's fleeting like i know the digital technology you can record things but like the performance itself i mean this is what uh anna mendieta said that each one is unique and that only photography facilitates it but the performance in itself is like evanescent and not it's it's not like a painting it's not like but then again, is music like that? Because you can record music, but music is still a performance. So I, I don't know. I, There's a I'm lot from of New York. yeah, I'm from yeah, New York. yeah. I'm from New York, and um, you know, so is New Paul. York is. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, I just mm -hmm. want to make sure. Well, in New York, uh, New York every York... crackhead on the street is doing a performance in New York. I mean, <laughs> well, no, right. no, well, I, I agree with you about the uh, intentions of it. Uh, I don't think that Chris Chan and it was is trying to do performance arts. I don't know if I would like count that. I could see it as performative. I mean, he's very creative. Uh, mm. But as as a New Yorker and doing performance art, uh, 
there's something about live performance that is just so different. It's different to see someone, whether it's a play or, or whatever kind of performance it is, even music, like you said, music, it's something different about going and seeing a jazz band or something play, or when you see theater, there's like the pit band or, or whatever it is, there's something different about live. It's just different. You can't capture it. And I have some pieces uh, I shared in the uh, chat. I did a performance art piece at an art gallery and uh, it was amazing. It was really powerful and moving. And a lot of people are really moved by the video that we took, but it does not compare to the live performance. There's just something, yeah, like you said, it's just uh, fleeting, I suppose, but it's just something different about having someone a few feet away from you doing something and performing. It just, it changes the dynamic of the art. And there's so, definitely a more personal thing to it. And especially even, even on live chat and there's like an, with live chat and stuff, there's an element of interaction. Even if it's like parasocial at times, you can like interact with like what's mm -hmm. going on. You can make a fool out of yourself. You can make a good point, you know, like there's loads of things you can do. It's all in between. And that makes it very engaging. It's like, rather than just kind of, even if a piece speaks to you, it's like, but yeah, it, I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not just like making something and then putting it out there for the world. It's yeah. it's it's an energy. And I mean, I, I consider it definitely, like I said, a trance. And uh, <laughs> I call myself Lady Alchemy. So obviously I'm into the esoteric kind of stuff. Well, and well, I perform, the yeah, when no, I perform, <laughs> I, I like I would take I believe it's kind of like witchcraft. You know, I take the energy when you have everybody's attention. It's like mass. It's like any sort of magic or whatever when you have all these live human beings and their intention is, you know, focused on you, their, their energy, you're able to take it. And then what do you do with that energy? You know, you have to take their energy and do something with it and give it back in a certain way. And that's the effect of live performance that's different through the internet and stuff like that. But yeah, like you said in chats, yeah, I think streaming can be- But does it make it, I don't know, it's like the, I don't know how to like value all of this. And this is why I don't like valuing shit because I feel like Paul's got the, the mental brain for valuing stuff. I don't like in terms of like giving it a, I don't know. Do you have like levels for stuff, Paul? Like you seem to have like a system of like, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit too, I'm just like, I like this or I don't like this. This is kind of where I'm at in my young brain. I haven't got it figured out yet. So it's just like, you seem to like, well, yeah. like liking things and, and, and learning to, judge things correctly is something else i mean i like mm. dragon ball but i understand that there's a difference between dragon ball and little nemo that but that doesn't mean it's just a you know that little nemo is just better in some kind of abstract way Th there's differences and little nemo is you know, it's it's more gentle, it's more poetic, it's 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 more mysterious. You know, but, but on the other hand, Dragon Ball, you know, it's it's full of these crazy Japanese obsessions with atomic explosions and destroying worlds and and uh, you know developing and becoming super. You know, it's 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 this crazy thing that a lot of it is silly, and then it's got all this silly humor. So you know, it's 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 what it is. But you know, if Oh, if you had to choose, you know, if you had to choose, like if you had to live forever and you could only live with one thing, but, you know, we don't live forever and we can, we can look at a lot of things and enjoy a lot of things, but it, it, it comes down to that. And then you have to ask yourself serious questions about, you know, it, it, you know, there, there's a, there's a lot of subtleties to judgment. It's not like just this is worth ten dollars and this is worth ten fifty. It's, you know, it's, it, it's more than that. Some things are, you know, there's a ton of there's a ton of books, but there's very very few books that are as good as Jane Austen. You know, there's there's a ton of there's a ton of painters, but few of them are as exciting and wonderful as Fragonard, even though they can be, you know, Bob Ross. Bob Ross is not an interesting painter. Uh, I mean, if you know anything about painting, it's it's uh, it because it's so formulaic. You've seen one, you've seen them all, and it doesn't go anywhere. You no, know, you compare it to Constable, and it doesn't exist anymore. 
Oh, sorry, I might have missed something, but what do you consider like a very, very high form of R or like the highest? Because I feel like I might have misunderstood something before. I feel like I thought you thought paintings are a lot better than I did. I don't know. What do you consider <laughs> high art? Well, yeah, painting is a very high art, but it could be practiced on a very low level. Well, you, it's you know, like, I, it's a I, fine I, art. Painting is a fine art. Well, I mean. yeah, but it, that's, that's, that's what that means because it, yeah. it's, it's an art that, that has so much potential for expression. The way Bob Ross practices it, I mean, you're better off watching Dragon Ball. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> exactly. Somebody finally mm. said it. And, uh, <laughs> and one uh, one visionary artist, I actually don't know if this was Young who painted it, but this is from Carl Jung's uh, Red Book. Geo, can you... Yeah, that me? was... Like, the, he, he painted That's these. Him. So... I'm curious where that was you over put... his town in in uh, yeah Switzerland. Like where where would you put uh, artwork uh, like this? And also, what this reminds me of in a way is the artwork of uh, man. I am such an embarrassment. Logo is gonna kick my ass. What's the name of that guy? Logo Daedalus is uh, he's a big fan of him. Uh, try to remember the name. Who Thomas did the Picton? Red Dragon? No, who did the Red Dragon painting? Uh, what is oh William with me? Blake. Yeah, William Blake, that's it. So William Blake also did these strange-looking paintings that they were not anatom anatomically that accurate, some of them. Some of them looked a little, a little odd. But uh, I don't know. I mean, these are different ones. Uh, They're more than, manneristic than that. in that sense, yeah. But, I, but I'm just curious. Like, would you put these in the same category as an Alex Gray as far as yeah, visionary yeah, yeah. art goes? Be because the purpose is more for, um, more for spiritual expression rather than... A conscious effort towards something that is fine art it's more of an illustration of young's inner psyche that produces art but it doesn't have the same uh, intentionality as art so it's something different it's it's an exp and, and it's funny because i think it wasn't as unconscious as young made it out to be i think that because he studied uh, when he went to Africa and he studied tribal art forms and when he, he had a working knowledge of aesthetics in, in, uh, in, in Zen Buddhism, for instance. Uh, but when he painted those, he was only acquitted. He was only acquainted somewhat with tribal art. And only later on, he learned about like Zen ink paintings and so forth. So this is in a way it's young stumbling onto something uh, that is art, but it, wasn't meant for the art world it wasn't meant as a dialogue of art itself or painting it's rather what he saw in his or he claims to have seen in his uh what he called active imagination uh hallucinatory visions that was to express an unconscious and then later on he did a bunch of stuff with learning about mandalas and the, their significance and so forth mm. but there was some things that he did get wrong unfortunately but it wasn't perfect because the translations he was using weren't perfect at the time so i don't know what do you think i mean what do you guys think i i, I do find great value i actually own the red book i actually when it first came out i bought it uh, that oh, was my one, birthday one quick present question about the Red Book, because I was thinking of getting it, but isn't it written in German? It, it's written in High German, but it also has Arabic and, and um, Arabic and, and Hebrewic words. But it's mostly written in High German. That's why it took so long to translate, because Young was writing in a, a different form of German than what but most people. But the book that you have German, is it translated? Because when I looked at the yes, pages, yeah, they yeah, were... they're they're all translated in the back. Uh, I have next to me i don't have the big one maybe i'll show it on the stream one day oh that would but, be nice but next to me i have the reader's edition which is basically just the translation mm. and the it's the original prose it's it's not the original that he wrote but it's basically just the translation it's like this is like the the pocket version of the red book because so, the red so you book could have like large. one you could have like a digital version of the red book next yeah there to is the original version. red book and then just look at them at the same time and that's how yeah you that's can, uh... yeah yeah there's okay i could do because that. Because Shum Desa Professor Shum Dasani, who translated it or helped translate it, he organized it in such a way where you have to like um, the figure the figure notes, so you could like flip back back and forth from like the translation with the paintings to like the text that you're reading. But it is quite it gets quite tedious after a while doing it that way. It's kind of like uh, it's, yeah. No, I have, a, I have a great digital. system for reading, by the way. I have this remote control. And in fact, let me actually show you guys real quick uh, what it looks like. But while I am showing this to you, I have a question that was uh, 
asked in the chat right now uh, by uh, Wander, can you ask Paul about Japanese art? And what one quick thing I wanted to add for my own observation of Japanese art, which I don't know, Gio, like I think you didn't agree with me last time when I brought it up, but I think that unlike Chinese art, Japanese art, and I'm not talking about anime even, like pre-anime, Japanese art it looks way more sillier and more cartoonish. Just like the expressions, like the facial expressions that the characters, whether they're like the dragons or the uh, men with the beards or whatever, you know, like there was a certain very cartoon-like expression that they had in these early drawings and paintings or, or prints that I think carried off into anime. And it makes me understand why anime they, is as well, it, it came, is. Yeah, it came originally from no theater and, and other... It's hard to say because the Japanese didn't have a concept of the aesthetic till much later. Their art was meant for a lot of the the prints that we see really come from like that period in what was it the Meiji, um, like the 19th century poster prints. They were mostly like advertisement prints for plays and and other things. And but then when the Europeans got a hold of it, the the impressionists, that's when the consciousness of Japonism. Uh, really took off in a big way but there are similarities of course in terms of traditional chinese and japanese art because they're both reliant on sumi e practices uh, for example the landscape of both china and japan the ink landscapes are very similar to each other although zen art uh has more figuration but their figuration isn't what europe was doing at the time because the point is not objective rendering of the figure it's more of the, the energetic sort of presencing of the figure and, and concealment of the figure. So that's why they end up looking cartoonish and alien. And um, they didn't place as much importance on objective rendering of the physical figure. There's a lot of like mythology and, and uh, ideas that come from that, that later were translated into more vulgar forms of Japanese art when the Europeans came, such as Kabuki theater and, and uh, the, the, the uh, theater bill poster prints that were made on mass and some of them got into the hands of uh, people like Van Gogh and uh, and Monet and Mamet and you know other people guys I'm gonna yeah. run uh, I'm outside it's probably like 35 degrees now so oh, oh, man, shit. Get out here. but uh, well, I appreciate the invite on. I hope this yeah yeah it's warm. warm man Dale of Norway you know <laughs> wait you're in Norway <laughs> but, uh, right now no, no, no. The sweater is oh. some <laughs> where, without sweater. doxing yourself. Uh, where are you? I'm in Arkansas. I'll dox myself. I don't care. Arkansas, uh, nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah like, sure. Is it like the middle of middle of nowhere, pretty much? No, um, I'm in Northwest Arkansas, so it's like the more inhabited. Uh, like people here have like three teeth instead of two. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little better. You kind of you kind of do have the Bill Clinton type of. Uh, accent going on a little yeah bit. for sure my grandpa knew bill so oh yeah. nice. I, I wonder yeah. if you could talk maybe about my, those, maybe my maybe my maybe he knew those kids, my grandma yeah. those kids who died on the on the train tracks you know because they smoked <laughs> oh, weed and then fuck. they uh you know passed away and then the train hit them or yeah i don't know what you're talking about but yeah okay sure. okay that, that's fine <laughs> <laughs> does that happen in arkansas is that what you mean yeah, well, there was this whole thing about like, uh, and look, I have to read more up on this because I'm just, I'm just being a tube right now. I'm just being a tube of information that I heard from other people. So please forgive me. But it has to do with the whole drug running that supposedly was going it, on through Mena, back the, in the where day. Bill Clinton got a cut because they were flying. The CIA was flying yeah, drugs yeah, through Mena, Arkansas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So Bill Clinton got a cut, and uh, he, you know. <laughs> yeah, don't mess with Arkansas, dude. Don't mess with Arkansas. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure being on. It was uh, great meeting some of you guys. Paul, it's good to yeah. see you, buddy. Yeah. I'm going to have to make yeah, – I think Chris and I are going to have to come over to France or something. and Do it. Do it. Uh, well, I'm going to have to learn to painting from Paul. I have to move to France. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Sweep yeah. The studio 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 that was <laughs> great. Yeah, your video, you said, well, first you're going to sweep the studio. The next year you're going to learn how to draw a straight line. That's <laughs> – that's great, man. Have a good Take one, care, no one. Thank you so no much. One. See you. One. Thanks, buddy. See you, see you, no one. Peace, peace. And guys, don't forget to subscribe. We've received several subscriptions already that I am very appreciative subscribe. of. Subscribe.
And this is not the end. You guys are gonna have to keep on subscribing, and I love you to death. You guys are you guys are the best. There is nothing better than I love than sitting down here and watching the BTR stream. The only thing that will be better is I wanna have streams in the future where it's like in the sauna, like a Russian like a Russian sauna, and you see me through the glass. I just have to get one of those microphones that, you know, can withstand extremely hot temperatures. I'm sure that they're around, right? Like get a microphone, put it through a hole so you can hear me speak. <laughs> speaking in the sauna but i'm gonna be in the sauna and you'll see me through the glass and i'll like be waving and stuff and i'll be hitting myself with the birch leaves you know while somebody else is speaking it'll be a lot of fun i think it'll be fun and uh anyway guys subscribe right now to the show become a patron patreon.com slash break the rules 20 dollars patronage gifts you very very beautiful looking in fact i am going to show these off to you guys right now because look i know that the people in the uh youtube have seen them but I don't think you guys have seen them. It just takes me a little bit to reconfigure my brain and to find where exactly they are. I'm just, you know, rummaging through the documents here, but I'm going to show them off to everybody so everybody sees these beautiful uh, magnet fridge magnets made out of wood. I'm going to load that up right now. And Geo, they are also going to get for $50. Not only they are they going to get custom magnets, but they are also going to get from Jules a uh, hand-painted uh, uh, figure from Warhammer 40k. And from yourself, 40 Geo, War. From 40 War. <laughs> 40 War. <laughs> 40 Hammer. <laughs> 40 Hammer. Sorry. 40 I mean, hammer. 40 Hammer sounds cooler. Like a four-dimensional a Hammer of Time. Way cooler than whatever the wall sounds <laughs> Yeah, that's what happens when you can't win 40 chess. You just wipe, whip out the 4D hammer and let, I'll let that do the talking. Uh, so, Gio, what do they get? They get a uh, beautiful drawing from you. Uh, the uh, Bob Ross, I know that we were kind of shitting on Bob Ross earlier, but uh, <laughs> you are better. You are better than Bob Ross. Far, oh, better, wow. far better than Bob Ross. The, uh, yeah, you get the Bob Ross sketch, you get a print, so you get all of the other tiers plus at the $50 level. But at the $30 a month, you get one of my prints from That Feel When no GF series one of five. I will pick a random one out of the five, but uh, yeah, that's what you get at the thirty dollar tier. Uh, and I, I really, I, I only did it for the meme value because I truly feel that that movie destroyed the meme itself. But uh, uh, sorry again, I, I really mentioned can't bot once in this stream, so <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, you um, can't <laughs> mention can't bot anymore. Well, Here we go. Well, he bitched here. out of coming to the show, so it's not my fault. Yes, exactly. So it's all right. So, <laughs> so, here, so here are the magnets. These are the magnets, maple, mahogany, ashwood, cherry. This is what they look like. Mm. Here they are for all of you guys to see. The, there these has the to magnets. be a teak one. That's there has really to be a expensive. What? <laughs> There's got to be a teak one. What is teak? I'm not too familiar with it. It's the like word one teak. of those expensive woods. You know what? You know what really pisses that me would off be an about. Antique. Yeah, yeah. You know what really pisses me off about what? It's fucking. It's impossible. I have this set of uh, engraving tools to do engraving prints, like for more finer detail. It's impossible in Canada. I don't know why we have so much wood in this country. It's impossible to find uh, blocks of end grain, which is like the, the end of the grain instead of the side. It's impossible to find blocks that are like less than $40 and have like ridiculous shipping charges. I hate this man. Yeah. yeah you guys are up to your, you guys are up go, to your eyeballs and in wood. What would you say, Paul? Go out and cut a tree down. No, yeah, no, I have. Cause my is that even legal? Contract, can, you cut trees? can you cut trees in Canada? Do they allow you to do that? Oh, yeah. I mean, we get free wood all the time. Uh, me and my old man okay. were per currently in the process of chopping wood for a fireplace. Uh, but, yeah, yeah I, I'm fortunate that my old man's a, a concrete contractor, so I have access to tools and wood. And, but, like, I make my own, my own, uh, my own canvas boards and everything so nice it's, oh. yeah it's really that's it's, also uh, a good way nice. to dispose of your enemies like if we were living back in the roaring <laughs> 20s during the mafia days you know like in dick tracy they put that guy in the cement and it's like you know that could be a good way to dispose of a body right how would the there, there's yeah there's them? a cannibal corpse song encased in concrete so that's nice uh, i was thinking and, of actually doing something with concrete um uh, maybe some form of like sculpting but it's uh yeah, you have to get it just right. There are people who do that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. In so, case... Paul, I, I wanted to go back to the Jap uh, Japanese art <gasps> question because I kind of yeah. hijacked that away. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, Paul, uh, what what do you think of like this uh, traditional uh, Japanese art? Well, I, I learned recently, which it doesn't surprise me at all, but it was Hokusai who invented manga. 
<laughs> and it, it, it meant quick, funny drawings. And I, I saw some examples of it. Hiroshige did some too. And I, I saw some examples in this show I saw. But the thing about Japan is that it's the, the whole society is super artistic. And talking about performance art, you know, everything in Japan, in the traditional Japanese society, everything is ritualized. And then you have the tea ceremony, which is performance art before performance art. And everybody's there, you know, and, and, and everybody counts and how you turn the bowl and how you tap the, <laughs> the thing and, and, and the beauty of the clothes and, and they, they have this developed thing. So it's, it's, it's an astonishing European culture. It used to be a little bit more like that, but Japanese, you know, the Japanese thing, it penetrates every aspect of their society. Mm -hmm. Do you think it comes down to, I don't know, having to struggle against the elements living in such a tiny island? I mean, not just that. I'm sure it's like a combination. Well, they're they're of not things, the only but... ones. They're yeah. not the only ones. So, no, it's 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 them. They got into that. They and they're they're interesting also in that they 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 would glom on to stuff. They glommed on to all this Chinese art. And did stuff with it and. Oh, it's 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 pretty interesting because they they turn everything into they turn everything into art the the way they the way they walk you know everything mm -hmm. it's it's even a little it's alarming like, and intimidating. Well, and it's the fact that like they didn't a, have a concept of of an aesthetic till much later, it's to well, them, I, I don't know about that. I, I I don't I don't know about that. You know, that's like this thing. You know that. There was no romance until the romantics came along, and there was no <laughs> well, romantic. Yeah. You know, it, 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 that that isn't true. You read Daphnis and Chloe, or or the Greek poets, and it's the well, is is the word aesthetic is a fairly modern word, but obviously, you know, the Japanese had this highly developed artistic sense in in all directions. You know, the, the, everything mm -hmm. is. Everything is ritualized. I mean, we, we have we have rituals, but they're they're much looser. You know, we got to wear a t-shirt and torn jeans. I mean, that's a ritual. All, all these, <laughs> yeah. All but these in, in, in a way, also looser. like the dresses and the outfits that people wore back in the day, the ones that may have been a lot more constraining. And Martina, maybe you can speak of this as well. Like these dresses are in a way like the petals of the flower they are they are sacred geometry so when we were talking before about dmt and the world that you go into in dmt i personally believe paul that there is a lot more out there not just experienced within the brain but experienced within just like living in consciousness and i talk about this all the time like i think that there are other levels that people go into some higher some lower but levels where you would be able to be inside of living art and i think that this physical reality that we're in right now is one where we are able to manifest albeit in a slightly crude way these sacred geometry dmt formations having us be like living plant people when we put these outfits on or if you take a look at the outfit that the japanese emperors wear it completely turns them into this otherworldly being like some weird floating final boss from a video game you know like or one of the angels from Evangelion. You know, it has this very DMT otherworldly feel to it. While I say otherworldly, but what I mean by that is just like this, you know, other layer that's added on top that's like very impressive. And uh, I don't really, I don't, I can't even put it in words. Something that you see when you go into a Shinto temple. You know, when you see the way that the Shinto temple is designed, it kind of looks like another being, like another creature that's physically present. Yeah, sorry. Sometimes you just say a lot of stuff that I, I, I have like a million different offshoots that I want to <laughs> write down before I forget them. But just something that reminded me about what you were saying uh, and what Paul was saying was about like this ritual type of performance almost. And uh, in the West, I, I mean, you have that with like the coronation of the queen and like things like that. There's some like and with the costuming and what they put on and the crown and, you know, what it all means. Uh, so there's definitely an association with 
with that. And that's how I feel with Lady Alchemy. It's certainly not the same girl you see here. <laughs> you know, it, it, my whole energy shifts when you get your performance persona on and it's, it, it is another world, like an outer worldly, otherworldly uh, kind of experience. And it's not unique to me. Like I said, they do it with, with these rituals and the royalty. Martina, and there, there's the mass. Mass, ritual mass. And that's what I try to tell people too when they freak out about the alchemy stuff. They, how can you be Marriage? Catholic? It's, yeah, I, it's, it's literally called a ritual mass. And that's what I love about Catholicism's aesthetics is that it's super aesthetic. You know, they come out with the staff and the scepters and the gowns and the incense. You know, they even use the scent as a, as a sense. Uh, for this ritual and the choirs and the the way that it bounces off the the cathedral and and the whole ritual is uh, yeah weddings are a ritual stuff like that or sacraments are all a, a ritual yeah for sure definitely well that's so, like what that's like you know in that one interview um, where Marina Abramovic was trying to like askew people of the ritual uh, like she's doing some kind of ritual. Where she's like, no, no, it's it's in a gallery context, therefore it's not a ritual. It's like that's no. kind of sus, right? Because no. it's still it's in a fine art project, but it's still a ritualization of an art performance, which in itself is like, you know what I mean? It's uh yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's and I was saying it earlier. <laughs> Yeah, that is very dishonest to say because it, it it is definitely all a ritual. And like I said earlier about when I'm performing at a theater, uh, there's a, a nightclub called The Box, and they, it's uh, owned by Simon Hammerstein. It's the Hammerstein Ballroom. What, relative, Related I to guess? Rogers and Hammerstein? Probably the Hammerstein Ballroom guy. Like he's the Hammerstein. So he's like younger. He's probably a little bit older than me, but you know, young. He's not an old guy. And so he created this modern kind of take this contemporary take on on being a hammerstein and created something called the box and it was a very i would i'm going to say the word avant-garde place to go because it was very very crazy and wild it's, it was like studio 54 but today you know what studio 50 was in the wild and the celebrities and the crazy performances that people are probably on drugs definitely on drugs <laughs> including simon and uh the performances were just very strange sometimes and meant to trip you out and uh, that's the thing. Yeah, like I said, when I'm there in the nightclub, and I was sober doing all this too, by the way, uh, even alcohol, I stopped drinking alcohol. And so I would, I had anxiety, stage anxiety, and I dealt with it with drinking. And then I realized not to do that, you know, and uh, it was taking away from the whole experience and not very healthy. So I would perform and have to deal with this anxiety through, you know, breathing techniques and all of these meditative things. And once you step on stage, and like I said earlier, you have everybody's attention. Now, what are you going to do with it? And that is the ritual. I considered it my ritual, my being a witch, you know, and putting my energy back onto them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that is, again, live performance. It's unique to live performance. Someone standing in front of you and just like trolls and whatever online, they can say things and do whatever and be vile. But it's different if they're face to face with you, you know, so it's the same thing with the performance. There's a different energy when someone's standing a few feet in front of you and they're doing a performance. I saw a Shakespeare performance one time in New York and it's just like, wow, like look at them like a few feet over there. Like it changes you as an audience member. You're like, wow, that's pretty badass. You know, this is crazy. It affects you differently. And you also get the secondhand embarrassment or, or excitement from them performing. You're physically feeling it live. It's different than watching a movie. Totally different. And uh, when it comes to your performance, Martina, as well as the performance of animation of these guys, I feel a big shamanist quality in all these different performances. Like when I look at these three gentlemen over here, these are both from uh, Studio Ghibli, obviously. We recognize Hayao Miyazaki over here. But when I take a look at these three guys, they remind me of this guy over here who's the Siberian shaman. And I'm not just saying that because, you know, they look like, you know, they have Asian features or whatever, but there is something very shamanistic about a lot of these people. And uh, I think it's a quality that since we're so self-absorbed a lot of the times, we end up missing out on and connecting to something bigger than us. While them mm -hmm. and uh, to a certain extent, a lot of Japanese people, as well as yourself, Martina, you are able to exhibit those qualities just because you're paying attention 
And I say the same thing for you, Luke, and you, Gio, and of course you, Paul, you know, like if we're opening ourselves up, if we're paying attention, then we are able to, you know, like that Pocahontas song, you know, we're able to see the colors of the wind or however it goes. You, you get what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> was it smell the colors of the wind or taste the colors of the wind i don't remember something about the colors of the wind if you if you get rid of that willow tree it's not going to grow well is that how it went i don't remember anyway <laughs> anyway yeah pocahontas that takes me back i know i like lion king more though you know what i used to do as a kid by the way i don't know if anybody here in the chat ever did this before I used to, when I used to, you know, uh, play with uh, play with my action figures, I used to put my legs in such a formation that, that it would look like that thing from the Lion King. You know, that, uh, that pride rock? I used to put my legs in this, the formation of pride rock. I completely forgot about that. Man, just the memory just shot right back into me. So maybe I was the only one who did that. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, guys, okay, I so think that... Along with your cap Along with your craft calf raising, you have to see if you can do that formation again. That's right. Yes, the calf raising. Look, I was almost about to end the stream. Last chance. Last chance saloon. If you guys want me to raise some calves, you guys got to pony raise up. Raise some calves. So, <laughs> yes. So <laughs> let me know. Let me know how much you're willing to pony up in the chat and how many calf raises you think I will do. I will be right back. I need to refill this water bottle up because I'm really thirsty. I'm a thirsty boy. I'm a thirsty boy. And I need your subscriptions not to be thirsty anymore. Well, wait. You fill what me time up is it? Maybe we should... It is 7.49, so uh, how about this? Geo, uh, uh, whatever question you think is still unanswered right now, let's go through that right now, and we can then end the stream. But let's see mm -hmm. what happens with the calf races. If not now, then we're going to do it uh, tomorrow from 12 noon. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a radio stream. Afina is coming on, and Geo, you're coming on as well. Yes, yeah. Granted, my hopefully the, my... Hopefully fucking Kojiko fix the problem by now. But yeah, I think they've fixed it. They've yeah, so don't worry. I'll I'll be on. I'll be on. Uh, wait, is it Hayao Miyazaki's birthday today? Is that yes, what they're saying in the is. chat? Huh, what a coincidence, right? There we go. Happy birthday, Hayao Miyazaki. What, Excellent. He didn't he wasn't the one that did uh what did Miyazaki do? He did uh Spirited Away, my oh, neighbor. Oh yeah, was still really okay. No, it was Kojima that did Metal Gear Solid or Metal yeah. Gear. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, January January five. There we go. That's his birthday. Happy birthday, Hayao Happy Miyazaki. Birthday. Happy I'm birthday, Hayao Miyazaki. Happy birthday, Hayao Miyazaki. I guess the last question would be: um, I have a pride tattoo. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> does Paul know about physio? Ask Paul about physiognomy. <laughs> no, physiognomy is totally real, by the way. Um, no, I guess. <sighs> I, the controversial question, I guess, Paul, would be like, "What? What is your defense of the Rococo? Why are you so <laughs> attracted to Watto and Boucher and and well, Frag? Uh, I consider Fragonard to be like a, a cut above. But what what is this thing? Don't you consider it the bourgeois kitsch pornography of its day? I mean, <laughs> this is the real stuff." Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I I made a video about it long ago, but I um I tried to get in touch with Roger Scruton. Yeah, you t yeah, and he like gave you this like very critical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I I because he was um I forget he was talking about pornography and kitsch, mm -hmm. and I I forget why I did it. I shouldn't have done it, but I sent him my uh, Europa. Never and meet I your said, heroes. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, is this kitsch? And who, who did it? And he says, that's a painting by Boucher, and it's kitsch, and it's worse than kitsch. <laughs> 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 and, I was, I, and that wrecked my opportunity. May, I don't know, because, I mean, he answered me at least. But wow. uh, I was very proud that he thought it was by Boucher. Well, the thing about Boucher uh, is that he was for a long time the dominant figure in painting in Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the and he I mean if if you if you can only see the uh 
the pink and blue in Boucher, you're, you're not getting it. It's a very, very powerful painting. But it's like, if, if you could, if you, if you look at it as an abstract painting, you know, it leaves everybody in the dust. And, and I think it's, it's um, I think cubism ultimately comes out of the Baroque and, and Boucher in particular, because he's, he's a kind of, I mean, there were other guys on that level, of course, but uh, Boucher, it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's astonishing. And it's like, <laughs> these incredible paintings that he, it, it, uh, the mastery of it is, is uh, breathtaking. But I, I but see, you know, you have to, you have to, yeah, yeah, you can't look at it in reproduction. You have to be in front of the painting. Mm -hmm. No, it, 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 it's, it's hard, it's hard in reproduction. Then, then you're, you're seeing it as an illustration. When you, when you see it, you know, and especially some of the bigger paintings. It's, uh, so, so he's this great master. And, and if you can't see past the imagery, it's too bad because you're, you're missing out. And it, it's got that, it's, a, it's even more serious than cubism. Cubism is really a crude form. But it, it, there, there's, a, there's a genealogy uh, well, you know, because he was, he was everybody. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, what about cubism? Oh. No, I was going to say, I think it was a purposeful crudeness in the way that neo primitivism was a purposeful crudeness because they were. Oh, sure. Trying, they were, they yeah. were abstracting. Like, yeah. Like, like, what do you think of Dadaism and stuff? Well, that, that's a, that's a whole different thing. You see, Dada is a, uh, and that's, that's Duchamp. And it's, um, it's it's a, it's a, I kind of like it. I kind of like it, but I get how some people are very Well, it's 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 I mean Dada first of all is supposed to be funny. So it has that but it's 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 not exactly you no know, now again this gets back to what I'm always trying to say, you know, it's categorized as art in a way that maybe it shouldn't be. The, the guys who were doing it, they were reacting to the First World War and they were, you know, yeah. and what, what was going on with them, what was going on in the art world. And then they were doing this stuff. And it, it was, um, it had an element of mockery. It had an element of despair. It had an element of fooling around. And, and it was, it was something they were doing, you know, that, no one was thanking them for it. No one was throwing money at them. N nobody was getting famous. It was like, it's like a bunch of kids, you know, inventing some kind of crazy game, like maybe any of us might have, you know, with some friends. And, and we do this and it's our game, you know, whatever it is, some kind of crazy thing we invent and we're in, the, in a tree or whatever it is. And we do that and it goes on for three weeks. And then 40 we years have a later, comment, by the way, from Pilos. This yeah. thing. <laughs> he says Dadaism is a meme gone too far. Yeah, I think. Well, Dada, I, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good way to <laughs> I, I think they were doing interesting things, but I feel that Dada was like kind of like the leftoid uh, artistry of its day, whereas German Expressionism, despite a lot of them going against Hitler, had uh, a lot of reactionary tendencies, especially uh, Dix and some mm. aspects. What about of, uh, Sheila? Egon Sheila? Yeah, Egon Sheila, some aspects in the way he he took uh, sexuality in the modern world. I feel that Sheila is the artist that is represented most in our current reality of like OnlyFans and mm. e-prostitution. Well, didn't I feel he also that... molest, uh, molest some girls? I'm yeah, sure. yeah, he, they say he molested a young girl, but like, the no, I mean... Yeah. The, the the art Venus secession in, in the German expressionist to me I feel is often overlooked and they represented a deeper tendency towards what is the 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 absolute ruin of the the period between the two world wars and I feel that German expressions as I said in the show before 
is relevant in terms of our time period and the current sort of Weimar conditions that we're going to now. Although I don't think we're going to get a base Chad dictator at the end of this. We're going to get a fucking Klaus Schwab in the Great Reset. Uh, hopefully not. In his, in his Dragon Ball Z uniform. Yeah, in his Dragon Ball Z like uh, Vegeta type. <laughs> 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 who was the vi- was broly a villain was broly a yeah villain? he was a villain yeah, yeah. well it's gonna be him versus uh uh what's the name of it? jeff bezos in his mech warrior suit yeah maybe yeah and then maybe like corporations will take on the role of government where like uh or like you know amazon will be drone striking disneyland and then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who knows um but i yeah i feel that, that there's a relevance there but i mean i guess i'm looking at the rococo as a whole being like this decline into decadence and pleasure. And, uh, Mm. but when you do look at, like, I'm looking at a Bouchard right now and, and there is, um, there is like such a mastery to it and especially his drawings, but I I don't know. I, it's not, uh, Mm. I don't know. I I'm too cynical for this type of art. I guess you could say, go look at, go look at the paintings. It's pronounced Boucher. Boucher, sorry, sorry, I, <laughs> I hated French class here, but uh, I, I should. It's funny how like I have such a proclivity towards French theory. I should have paid attention more, in uh, in school. So well, the British are the ones that are usually against the French. I don't know how the Italians and the French uh, feel about one another, but oh, I'm also yeah, noticing like 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 looking at the Boucher artwork, like maybe these were the anime idol girls of their day because they like, were the faces they, you know they unfortunately had a tendency to lens lend itself to the fetish the fetishistic but it's nowhere near the type of art that like again to <laughs> a lot of um these like woke instagram baddies are doing nowadays where they're they're uh i think one of the first pieces of art that crossed into pornography would be um who, who's the one that did the vagina painting uh, the famous one, George O'Keefe. No, not, not George O'Keefe. No. This was. Um, <laughs> I was like, what? Uh, I, I know, know you're talking exactly about Frenchman. the oh, up oh, close Mon- one. Yeah. Uh, Mon- no. It's called the Mon- creation of the world. The creation of the world. It's called. Yeah, the creation of the world. Yeah, uh, we obviously. I don't think we can show it because Cor- Corbet. Corbet. Yeah, Gustave Corbet. Yeah. Uh, oh, that I'm that was. Run, um... I'm going to run out of batteries, guys. Yeah, we we have to. I think we should cut this. Uh, we're gonna yes, be here. Well, I I, ju- I just want to say to uh, Paul Talk and to Martina and to Luke Valentine and to Geo and to everybody who was participating in this amazing stream. As always, you guys are the very best. Wait, guys, than before yeah, I just have to show you something. Uh, there's a Go for there, it. no, I'm not gonna show it because it has the painting in it. Ah. But there is a picture. Speaking of which, there's a picture of Marina Abramovic right next to the creation of the world painting. Oh, so, the, oh, and there's a picture of Tracy Eamon next to it, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 boy. Man. Oh, oh, oh. oh there's right, a guys. performance artist that's stripped in front of it. <laughs> She's showing her fucking. <laughs> uh, and there's a, there's a, it's a censored photo. Maybe I could post it. But um, yeah. Let me let me post it. Uh, they censor out um, her her thing. Make sure they censor everything. I'm not taking any chances anymore with this thing. Creation of you, the world, Corbet. You yes. can you can show nudity on YouTube. No, I mean there's. I think like, you yes, can. They show they have nude yoga. Yeah. They they yeah. do that now. This is, is like, from yeah. this is from uh, this is from <laughs> Artnet, oh, daring feminist performance artist. Uh, gives a modern ode to the Corbet classic. Oh my god! <laughs> I I fuck it. Oh man, why do I, I? I hate to say it, but like I waste too much time on on uh, this art theory stuff. I don't know. I, I <laughs> oh. if it fills your soul up, Geo, then uh, that's what matters. Fills Here my soul up with rot. That's the problem. But uh, <laughs> yeah. <they're... laughs> I, I feel like going. Go, everyone should do this. They should browse Artnet, browse uh, Artsy and Wide Walls. Like go to these contemporary art websites and just see what they're talking about. It's literally a wall of like woke politics. Like I could literally just go to uh, Artnet and I could like read you off the headlines. So let's see. 
Oh boy. <laughs> well, no, there's some good stuff on art. In it. Like uh, I noticed uh, hyper, hyper allergic and artsy. Those are the two worst in terms of like art uh, woke politics. Oh, Frieza as well. Frieza is total trash. They, they totally did Wait, a hit from job. Dragon Ball Z. No, no, the, the website Frieza, they totally did a hit job <laughs> on a lot of uh, artists that I like. And it's just, uh, just, ah, damn. Uh, look right up here. Banksy, Cindy Sherman, Kusama. Mm. Those are the visionaries of the art world now. Well, I know Kusama's doing things that are interesting, but no, I, we're going to be the, we're going to be the new visionaries of the art world. We're, yeah, we're taking this, I have no we're taking this thing by Banksy, force. As everybody knows. We're, we're going to take <laughs> this thing by force. So, uh, that, that's yeah. all I got to say about that. Listen, so, guys. Yes. Oh, did Paul leave? Yes, battery while Paul's code. battery died. So yeah, I'll have to join his Discord. So if someone can drop me the link to his Discord, I'll I I'll... can drop you a link. I've got the Discord, so yeah, I'll, okay. I'll send it to you. Yes, and uh, Martina, you've also got a Discord. You got some great people over there in that Discord that mm -hmm. support you, and I'm very happy for them, and happy for you, and happy for everybody here. Listen, guys, this is it. This is the end. But don't forget, subscribe to Break the Rules tomorrow, twelve o'clock, twelve o'clock sharp radio show. This is me going on Chris Tonti here is the rundown live as btr as break the rules simulcasting so it's going to be here you guys are going to go to this youtube channel it's going to be here just like all the other channels in fact it is on right now let me just quickly send you guys the link so you just go there you uh just uh set a reminder for tomorrow don't forget to go there i'm going to do that right now all of yous all of yous i'm talking to you all of you go in there and uh, hold on, it's loading, it's loading. Uh, here we go, we're almost here. Radio stream, dawn of the second day. This is what's going down tomorrow. So here is the link. I am posting it on the chat. You guys should see it in the chat in YouTube. Here it is. Click on it. Go there right now. Make sure you set a reminder. 12 noon tomorrow, going from 12 noon to 3 o'clock. We're going to have Afina Hyatt on, and we're going to have Gio on, and we're going to have a couple of more great mm -hmm. guests on. So guys, be there or be... You know, you know what I'm talking about. You, you know what this is, right? Okay. I love you guys. You guys are the best. Uh, follow me on Twitter, by the way. Left Poe on Twitter. I never promote my Twitter, and I should. Well, follow follow Martina on Twitter as well. The great Martina Marcotto. Follow Luke. Here, I'm going to do a Twitter promo for all you guys. I know that I said we're <laughs> going, but here we go. Oh, yeah. Tw Twitter, Twitter promotion time. So, Luke, you are an amazing artist, comic artist, illustrator. You, uh, that 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 girl you posted, she is really she is really cute. She is uh, she's really nice. Uh, she's got like if Pamela Anderson was uh, nicer looking, it would be her. You know, I appreciate so. that. That's an, uh, that's an interesting <laughs> yeah. take. You know, I mean Pamela Anderson's kind of weathered right now. But oh, very back, weathered. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very Little, but, little. but even back, but even back in the day, though, you know, like uh, I know yours is way, uh, you know, w way nicer. So here we go. This is Luke's. Pamela Anderson over here. sex tape wasn't even that great. No, not Tommy. that I saw it. By the I way, every time it. that I said Tommy, I was growing up during <laughs> the internet. I thought they were talking about Tommy Pickles from Rugrats. I was like, what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you guys seen that storyboard jam, by the way, the Rugrats storyboard jam, that's very interesting. It's when uh, Stu Pickles comes in and takes Tommy's bottle away and drinks it himself. Says, oh, yeah, hey, that tribute episode. To the alpha male, alpha male freeloader. Martina's shaking her head like, what the fuck is going on? I don't remember okay. that one. I'll send I'll send it to you. And Angelica's like really happy that he's like asserting his alpha maleness and Tommy's just like, what do you call it? He's just going into a seizure and he dropped his mothballs. Why I thought somebody... you guys. I thought you were talking about a real episode, like the uh, no. I'm making chocolate pudding at 4 a.m. or something. No, 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 I'm talking about a storyboard jam, which is something that the animators of uh, Rugrats or the storyboard artists uh -huh, okay. they liked to do in their spare time. And some people, I think, were uh, some people confiscated that uh, that storyboard, but uh, like a page of it is still around. So here we go, Martina Marco to follow Martina on Twitter. And let me do Gio over here. I just had to put all these in the spreadsheet just to do them all at once because, you know, I got to type things in manually over here. But it is well worth it because number one, number two, and number three, I want to promote the hell out of my friends, the people who are on this stream. You guys are all amazing. Here we go. Giant Geo. Follow Geo on Twitter. I'm sure all of you already are, but if not, follow Geo on Twitter <laughs> right now. Make it happen. Make it possible. And finally... Geo, you better follow me back. I know you don't like anime thighs, but you better Oh. Back uh -huh. Well, we're gonna get oh. Gio into JoJo. <laughs> Gio, you're gonna... Wait, Luke, I don't follow you back. No, you don't. 
Giorno you know after, after this. <laughs> Giorno, fi- Giorno Giovanni. That's you, dude. <laughs> yes, you gotta, exactly. You got to pick up with the with the current JoJo arc. Exactly. And finally, Lef Polyakov on Twitter. Follow me. I'm going to be making some art myself real soon. I'm going to get right back into it. I used to do these pieces. In fact, there was one on my wall called Romeo. And- oh, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to show you Romeo and Juliet right now. Hold on one second. Even though I have it somewhere else. Hold on. Wait, what is he going to get? I don't know. Romeo and Juliet (laughs) painting? What? (laughs) I feel bad. I wasn't able to contribute very much. You guys were going a mile a minute. Oh, it's all right. Talking about uh, all these names. My goodness. Okay, so real quick before we go, this is what happened. I was in a play called Romeo and Juliet where I played uh, Lord Capulet, and my father took a photo of the girl who played Juliet in such a position that she had a booger that was sticking out of her nose. And uh, when I saw that, I was inspired. This is when I was like 12 years old, and I drew this picture called Romeo and Juliet. He- oh! Shit, I, hold on, hold on. No, I can do this. I can do this. Hold on, I'm going to turn the green screen on. Fuck this chicken. I mean, don't fuck this chicken. Don't be a chicken lover. Chicken loving is bad. And anyway, we over here. Uh, no, that's meeting settings. Do you, know, do, you remember that, do you remember that scene in uh, Devil's Rejects where he's like, you'd take a chicken. Never mind, I'm not going to do it. Not gonna do- <laughs> he called me a chicken fuck. <laughs> here we go. I'm turning off the background. I love, by this. the way, this one piece from <laughs> this one piece you did where it's um like the thigh the thigh action in splatter brain is just off the charts hell but yeah <laughs> the, the one recent one you did uh the line work where it's like this uh, cutesy girl anime with yeah, like the yeah. lifeguard hat she's got a game boy color no sorry game boy advanced i had one of those back in the day and uh, just like the uh, the backside shot, the panty shot is just uh, phenomenal, my friend. That's her bathing. That's her bathing suit. It's not that lewd. It's uh. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's pinup. You know, we're not going it's pinup. Pinup. It's I'm trying to be a little huh. bit tasteful. Not we, too, we have uh, to. You know. We have to go back to the natural hangers of the pin up, pinups. Uh, this whole the I I think we have to get rid of plastic. We have to get rid of tit jobs. I mean, I'm sorry, folks. It's just it's right, uh, not appealing to me. I never seen a good one. I've never yeah. seen a good exactly. Never seen a good one. I can always never tell when it's, when it's uh you know and and they don't feel too good either. Yeah, <laughs> they don't feel too good. Oh. In my no, you remember that South Park episode? Like he said, like ooh, it feels like I don't remember what he said. Bags but, uh, of sand. Yeah, so, so, yeah. It feels like a bag of sand. That's what it feels like. It's it's not like even people are like, but here's the thing. I feel like the problem, and and people are starting to recognize this. There is a renaissance of appreciating thick women now. You have to, <laughs> if you want if you want big tits and in, in big at a big ass. They go you, overboard sometimes, though. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. No, sometimes they go a little yeah. too thick. But you gotta have you gotta have the body to accommodate that level of thickness. I feel. Sure. You know, you don't want the porn star like like balloons on a stick type of look i don't know it's just we gotta we gotta go back like my my, my good friend lady astor posts these uh these uh you know these old style like 20s uh pinup women and they just the, this the, the beauty of it is the fact that they're not revealing too much it's it's yeah. there's more to come there's uh, more, more to, to come <laughs> in eroticism there's more, more to come Okay, here it is. So this is Romeo and Juliet. I did it at 12 years old, and this is the kind of stuff that I want to go back to making. It's like, uh, I don't know exactly how to... This is Juliet over here. She's got what the, the bigger her nose. What the hell is What? This is Juliet, and over here you can see Romeo. Hold on. This, these are the Capulets. And this is Romeo, and Romeo, as you could see, he is a Mongolian man with lollipops on his nipples you know you on the armor where the nipples are there what? is a turtle there is a turtle over here on his no. belt he has a turtle for a belt who is smoking a a, c- a cigarette and there is a phone that was slightly inspired by salvador dali you know like lobster phone yeah this phone yeah. has spikes coming out of it and there's like a guy oh my God. who was nailing a twisted, sword lab. i don't know pretty guy, surrealist yeah. right here let's see, let's see what's the date it's five uh five oh two 2002 so there was a guy who was nailing a, uh, a sword into the leg of Romeo while the angry turtle looks on 
And what do we got over here? We got like a hairy armpit mouse, a King Kong like figure destroying buildings. I think that's like post 9 11 uh, trauma over there. And you see Romeo's leg, it's taped to the stage. There's a weird little bug thing over there. And this is the stage. So what do you have? You have a characters that appeared in some other things. My acting teacher, Marcel, is the long haired guy who is uh, holding up a balloon with a devil on it. You see, he's like right in the front. You see him, right? He's next to this mustache guy with an 88 on his shirt, who is actually Juliet. So Romeo over here, who I mentioned, who was actually inspired by little Romeo. You remember who is that rapper? Uh, the, uh, Son oh my god, Master throwback, P. man. You remember him? So after Every I saw rapper that, had Lil in yes. front of their name? Yes, exactly. So when I Hell saw yeah. that on Slime Time Live, I decided, Hell you yeah. know what? <laughs> I'm going to make my own little Romeo. I'm going to make this Romeo right here, and I'm going to make Juliet, who is his uh, Romeo's father. So you could see Juliet right over here with the 88 on his shirt. Gio, you see Juliet, right? You see where he is, right? Where, um... He has an 88 on his shirt, Right oh, next yeah, yeah. to Marcel with the devil balloon. He and has a 1488 like... on his show? On his show? <laughs> no, no, just no. the 88. You know, you know what it reminds me of these that. drawings? There's this a drawing? what? what? It's, it's like um, when they show like the serial killers when they when they take to art. <laughs> like John Wayne like, Casey! Oh, it has that vibe. I think you were channeling <laughs> really something, Lab. I think uh, 2002 was an interesting year for you. Well, it was right. <laughs> It was right. Oh man, look at right all these Right after 9/11. The yeah. yeah, no, it was right after 9/11. Absolutely. So there Holy was a clock bro. over here. <laughs> there was a clock over here, and there's this guy who I wanted to make. Uh, he's like the guy who like runs this entire universe. This long-haired guy, and he comes from a whole dynasty of guys who look like him. They're wearing like a Freddy Krueger outfit, and they have this long hair. So he is sitting in the center of this clock. You have this plant, these planets. It's like a cosmic clock, and you have this lollipop man over here with a sword in his head who is resting on this lounge chair and over here this is like a portal so you have the same mouse hairy armpit man king kong who is demolishing the buildings what? inside of the portal and you have this portal over here with a skeleton uh you know with a skeleton over this, here. Is, so some, like this is some this is some anonymous bosch type of stuff <laughs> this is like sewer pipes over here uh, is you this see when the two you started doing pipes. mushrooms this is when, when I was 12 years him? old. I drew this at 12 <laughs> years old, guys. So, and over here, back again to poor Juliet with the booger sticking out of her, sticking out of her mm -hmm. nose and the skull and some fruits and some tissues over here, which she's apparently not using. And again, like the Capulets over here. This is Mr. Capulet and Mrs. Capulet. And Mr. Capulet was based on uh, Peter uh, Bruegel's painting of the Netherlandish Proverbs, where I'll send it to you later. It's this guy who is worshiping an idol and it looks like the idol has deer antlers. So I created like these cracks on the wall to look like deer antlers on a Capulet over here. So there we go. Romeo and Juliet. This is my artwork from 2002. And I want to keep making more art like this. And I will. I am going to become the fucking greatest. I am back at it again. I'm going to kick everybody's asses with your help. I need your energy. There and you, you guys go. are going to give me your energy. Because mm -hmm. this is the fucking will to power right here. I love you all. Take care. And I will see all you motherfuckers later. Woo! Goodbye. Good God bless. God Adios. bless. Adios, amigos. Bye-bye.